Story 1. I wake up to the sound of water gently lapping against the sides of what feels like a life raft. My eyes snap open to a world of blinding light and endless blue. It takes me a moment, one terrifying, heart-stopping moment, to realize I'm alone, adrift in the middle of the ocean. The last thing I remember is the music and laughter, celebrating with friends on a cruise ship. Now there's just the sun, an unforgiving blaze in a cloudless sky, my throat parched, and in every direction, an endless expanse of water that seems to mock me with its serene indifference. Days and nights blend into a continuous loop of survival and despair. I ration the meager supplies found under the raft seat a small container of water and a few packets of food, knowing it's not enough. As the sun sets each evening, painting the sky in hues of fire, loneliness wraps around me like a shroud. I shout into the void, my voice swallowed by the vastness, hoping for an answer, praying for rescue. The isolation begins to gnaw at my sanity. I talk to myself, to the sea, to a seabird that circles overhead, a silent observer to my plight. I name it Charlie, and its visits become the highlight of my day, a sign that I'm still part of the world, not just a forgotten speck adrift in a watery desert. As the days stretch on, the line between reality and hallucination blurs. The sea, once a thing of beauty, turns malevolent. It whispers secrets in the night, voices that rise with the wind and crash with the waves. I hear my name, beckoning, always beckoning. Sometimes it's the voice of a friend, calling me to swim, to join them in the depths. Other times it's an unknown, eerie tone, speaking in languages I feel I almost understand. One night, the moon casts a silvery glow over everything, turning the ocean into a mirror of stars. It's then I see it, or think I see it a shadow beneath the surface, massive and moving. My breath catches, heart pounding against my ribs like a caged bird desperate to escape. I tell myself it's just a cloud passing overhead, casting its reflection in the water, but the part of me that listens to the sea's whispers isn't so sure. I start marking the days by scratching lines into the side of the raft, a visual testament to my will to survive. But with each passing day, the hope of rescue dims. The supplies run out, and I'm left with nothing but rainwater collected in my makeshift container. Hunger becomes a constant companion, gnawing at me, weakening my body but sharpening my mind to an almost animalistic keenness. Then, the storm hits. It comes out of nowhere, a maelstrom of wind and rain, the sea rising up in towering waves that threaten to swallow me whole. I fight to keep the raft upright, to bail out the water that threatens to sink me. Lightning fractures the sky, illuminating the chaos in flashes of stark white light. Through it all, I hear the sea's voice, louder than ever, a tumultuous chorus that seems to scream my name. The storm passes as suddenly as it arrived, leaving behind a shattered calm. I'm exhausted physically and mentally, but alive. The sky clears and for the first time in what feels like forever, I see a glimmer on the horizon. Salvation, or merely the sun's cruel trick. I can't tell, but it ignites a flicker of hope within me. In the end, it's not the hunger, the thirst, or even the loneliness that's the hardest to bear. It's the uncertainty, the not knowing. Am I being guided by the voice of rescue or the call of the deep? The sea holds its secrets close, and as I drift on the edge of despair, I wonder if I'll ever find the answer. As I submit to the embrace of exhaustion, a sound breaks through my half-conscious state. It's different, mechanical, real. My heart leaps. Through bleary eyes, I see shapes on the horizon, growing clearer with each passing moment. Rescuers. At last, answering the call I wasn't sure was ever heard. As they pull me aboard, wrapping me in warmth and the promise of safety, I look back at the vast, inscrutable ocean. It whispers one last time, a farewell, or perhaps a warning, as I leave its depths behind, carrying its secrets in my own, forever changed by the call of the deep. In the safety and sterility of the rescue vessel, the ocean's vastness becomes a distant memory, almost dreamlike in its intensity. The crew treats me with a kindness that feels alien after days of solitude. 
They asked questions, many questions, trying to piece together how I ended up alone in the heart of the sea. I tell them about the cruise, the celebration, the storm that came out of nowhere, tearing me away from the ship, from safety, from everything I knew. They listen in silence, their eyes reflecting a mixture of sympathy and something else disbelief. Wonder. I can't quite tell. As the land approaches, a flurry of activity ensues on the vessel. I'm examined by medics given fresh clothes and fed until my stomach, unused to such generosity, protests. Yet, amidst this flurry of care and attention, I feel an inexplicable pull, a longing for the solitude and simplicity of the life raft. The sea, with its whispers and secrets, had become a part of me, and I, in turn, a part of it. The thought of returning to a world of noise, obligations, and endless chatter fills me with an unexpected dread. Story 2 I set out for a day hike in the vast wilderness, the beauty of nature all around me. The initial excitement of exploring uncharted paths fuels my steps, the lush greenery whispering ancient secrets. Birds sing from hidden perches, and the air is alive with the scents of earth and bloom. But as the sun begins its descent, painting the sky in shades of orange and pink, a sinking realization stops me in my tracks I've strayed off the path. Panic sets in as I frantically try to retrace my steps, but the forest has transformed. The once welcoming trails are now a labyrinth of shadows and deceit. My phone, which I'd relied on for navigation, is nothing more than a dead weight in my pocket, its battery drained. The last sip of water from my bottle does little to quench my growing thirst, and the cold begins to seep into my bones, an uninvited companion as the light fades. Night in the wilderness is a different beast, alive and pulsing with unseen eyes. Every rustle in the underbrush sends a jolt of fear through me, my imagination conjuring images of predators stalking me through the darkness. The cold hardens, becoming more than just a physical sensation, it's a relentless force, draining my strength and resolve with its icy fingers. As I stumble through the darkness, the reality of my situation settles in. I'm not just lost, I'm being hunted, not by any supernatural entity, but by nature itself, indifferent and unforgiving. The realization that I am now part of a primal dance, the hunted in an environment that does not distinguish between predator and prey, weighs heavily on my mind. I find a small clearing and decide it's as good a place as any to spend the night. My attempts to start a fire fail, the dampness of the underbrush and my own shaking hands conspiring against me. Huddled for warmth, I spend the night jumping at every sound, my imagination transforming the natural into the monstrous. Dawn brings little relief. The light filters through the dense canopy in slivers, mocking my hope for a new beginning. Hunger gnaws at my stomach, and the thirst becomes a constant ache. I start moving again driven by the primal need to survive, each step a testament to the will to live. The beauty of the wilderness, once my reason for venturing into the unknown, now feels like a cruel irony. The towering trees and vibrant flora that I had admired now seem to watch me with indifference, witnesses to my struggle against the relentless march of time and nature. Hours turn into another day, and despair begins to set in. The signs of civilization, a distant road, a trail marker, even the sound of another human remain elusive. The wilderness, in its vastness, seems to absorb my presence, diminishing me to nothing more than another creature struggling for survival. Then the real predators begin to make their presence known. Tracks of wolves and the distant howls at night remind me of my vulnerability. I see signs of bears, the overturned rocks and clawed tree trunks serving as a stark warning. The knowledge that I'm not at the top of the food chain here, that I'm intruding in a world ruled by tooth and claw, sends a shiver down my spine. In a moment of clarity amidst the haze of fatigue and fear, I realize that to survive, I must respect this merciless force of nature. I start to move with purpose, conserving my energy, using the natural light to my advantage, and finding sustenance in the form of berries and clear streams cautiously approached. On what feels like the edge of surrender, a distant sound catches my attention as sound out of place in the natural symphony of the wilderness. 
a helicopter, a search party, hope incarnate. I muster every ounce of strength left in me, moving towards the sound, signaling with my makeshift torch. The moment of rescue is surreal, a blur of faces and voices, warmth and safety. As I'm brought back to civilization, the wilderness remains a looming presence in my mind. It has taught me respect, humility, and the raw power of nature a force not to be underestimated or taken for granted. Story 3 It happens in an instant, so fast that my mind barely has time to register what's happening. The road bends unexpectedly, the car skids on a slick patch I didn't see, and then there's the stomach-dropping sensation of losing control. The world outside blurs into a frenetic swirl of colors and shapes, and then, with a heart-stopping crash, the terrifying plunge into cold, dark water. Water starts seeping in almost immediately, a slow but relentless invasion that chills me to the bone. I'm trapped. The power windows refuse to obey my frantic attempts to open them, and the doors, now under the immense pressure of the water, won't budge. It's as if the car, once a symbol of freedom and mobility, has become my prison, rapidly filling with water. Panic sets in, a living thing in my chest that claws its way up my throat. I'm screaming for help, my voice hoarse and desperate, but it's absorbed by the oppressive water surrounding me. Each breath becomes precious, my lungs burning with the effort of keeping calm and conserving air. The water rises steadily, a silent countdown to the inevitable. The cold seeps into my very marrow, numbing my fingers as I claw at the windows, the realization sinking in with the car I might not make it out. The darkness outside is complete, a suffocating blanket that hides my struggle from the world. My thoughts race, erratic and wild, flitting between regrets, unspoken words, and desperate bargains with any deity that might be listening. In the darkness, time warps. Seconds stretch into hours, each tick of my heart a thunderous sound in my ears. The water is up to my chest now, cold and uncaring. I think of all the stories I've heard, the advice casually given and never thought to be needed stay calm, conserve air, wait until the pressure equalizes to open the door. But nothing could have prepared me for the visceral fear of being trapped, the water a living entity that seeks to claim me. I realize that my only chance is the small pocket of air shrinking above me. I take deep, measured breaths, trying to slow my racing heart, to push back the panic that threatens to consume me. The cold is a constant companion now, a reminder of the grim situation I find myself in. In a moment of clarity amidst the panic, I remember the emergency hammer tucked into the side door pocket. With trembling hands, I reach for it, grasping it like a lifeline. The effort to move in the confined, water-filled space is immense, but desperation lends me strength. I position the hammer against the corner of the window, the part one had been told is the weakest, and strike with all the force my numbed body can muster. The sound of cracking glass is the most beautiful, terrifying noise I've ever heard. Water rushes in with renewed vigor, but it brings with it a sliver of hope. I kick at the broken window, the sharp pane of glass cutting into my leg a distant concern compared to the overwhelming need to escape. The water is unforgiving, pushing against me even as I struggle to pull myself through the small opening. Emerging from the car is like being reborn, a gasp of air filling my lungs as I break the surface. The night is silent, the world seemingly unaware of the drama that has unfolded beneath its serene exterior. I swim, my movements clumsy and driven by the instinct to survive, until my hands find the muddy bank. Lying there, soaked and shivering, I stare up at the sky, a tapestry of stars blinking back at me. The ordeal feels surreal, a nightmare I've somehow woken up from. But the pain in my leg, the cold that has seeped into my bones, and the car, now a shadowy shape beneath the water's surface, ground me in the harsh reality. Story 4 As I wake to the smell of smoke and the sound of alarms, a blanket of confusion wraps around me. It takes a moment for the gravity of the situation to sink in the building I call home is ablaze. The warmth of my bed has been replaced by a scorching heat that seems to consume the air itself. I stumble out of bed, my heart racing, 
as I try to make sense of the chaos that has erupted around me. The hallway outside my apartment is a vision of hell. Flames dance like demons, their tongues licking the walls and ceiling, devouring everything in their path. The heat hits me like a physical force, pushing me back, warning me of the peril just steps away. The smoke is blinding, a thick, choking cloud that seems alive seeking to suffocate. Each breath is a battle, the air scalding my lungs, the taste of ash and despair thick on my tongue. The crackle of the flames fills my ears, a constant, deafening roar that drowns out the sound of my own coughs. It's punctuated by the distant screams of others, a haunting chorus that reminds me I'm not alone in this nightmare. The building, once a sanctuary, has become a trap, a maze of fire and smoke with no clear way out. Panic sets in, a frantic, clawing thing that urges me to move, to do something, anything. I'm torn between the instinct to flee and the paralyzing fear of making the wrong choice. Every path is a gamble, a decision that could lead to safety or send me into the heart of the inferno. I remember the fire safety drills, the advice drilled into us for situations I never truly believed I'd face. Stay low, check doors for heat before opening, use a wet cloth to cover your nose and mouth. But in the moment theory crumbles under the weight of fear and the pressing need to survive. Armed with a damp towel pressed to my face, I choose a direction, crawling to avoid the worst of the smoke. The carpet scorches my hands and knees, a reminder of the fire's indiscriminate hunger. I reach a door, hesitating only a moment before pressing my palm against it, feeling for the deadly heat on the other side. It's warm, but not unbearable, and with a deep breath I push it open, ready to face whatever lies beyond. The sight that greets me is a mixture of relief and horror. The flames haven't fully engulfed this part of the building yet, but it's only a matter of time. The air is slightly clearer, and I take advantage of this brief respite, moving as quickly as my body allows. The goal is clear in my mind reach the stairs, descend to the ground level, escape into the night. But the fire is a cunning adversary, blocking paths, collapsing ceilings, and igniting explosions that shake the very foundations of the building. I dodge falling debris, my every move a dance with death. The screams have grown louder, more desperate, a soundtrack to the tragedy unfolding around me. In the midst of the chaos, a figure emerges from the smoke a neighbor, a friend, someone else caught in this nightmare. Together we navigate the treacherous hallways, supporting each other, driven by the shared instinct to live. The presence of another soul, equally frightened but determined, reignites a flicker of hope within me. Finally, the stairwell comes into view, an oasis in this desert of fire. We descend, the heat intensifying with each floor, as if the building itself is urging us to turn back. But retreat is not an option. The ground level is our only chance, our only hope of escape from the inferno. The moment we burst through the exit into the cool night air is surreal. The relief is palpable, a physical weight lifted from my shoulders, but there's no time to savor it. Firefighters battle the blaze, a symphony of water and flames, their efforts heroic against the relentless fire. I turn back to look at the building, my home now a towering inferno against the night sky. The reality of what I've escaped hits me, a wave of emotions, gratitude, sorrow, disbelief. Every choice, every choice, every gamble in those harrowing moments was a step towards this outcome. Survival. Story 5. I'm seated at my desk, the monotony of the workday blurred by the glow of the computer screen, when chaos erupts. It happens so fast a sudden, violent intrusion that shatters the routine. Armed assailants burst in their screams slicing through the air like knives, demanding attention, obedience, fear. In a split second, the office transforms from a place of business to a battleground, a stage for a nightmare I've only ever seen in movies. Adrenaline surges through me, a tidal wave of panic and survival instinct. As my co-workers react in a symphony of gasps and cries, I find myself moving on autopilot, diving under my desk. The cramped space becomes my sanctuary, 
a fragile barrier between me and the terror unfolding just feet away. My heart pounds against my chest, a frenetic drumbeat that drowns out the sound of my own thoughts. I fumble with my phone, the screen a beacon of light in the dark underbelly of my hiding spot. Texts to loved ones are typed with trembling fingers, each word a whisper of hope, a plea for safety. I love you, please be safe, there's been an attack, the messages are a lifeline, a tangible connection to the world beyond this madness. Prayers spill from my lips in hushed, fervent whispers, a mix of pleas for protection and promises made in desperation. Each second stretches into eternity, time warping in the grip of fear. I can hear the assailants moving through the office, their demands punctuated by the sound of sirens and chaos from outside. Negotiations play out over the phone, a back and forth that holds the lives of everyone inside in the balance. The fear is palpable, a living entity that coils around me, whispering terrible outcomes. I'm acutely aware of my vulnerability, the stark reality that my life, the lives of my colleagues, are at the mercy of desperate individuals. The powerlessness is suffocating, a heavy cloak that stifles hope and breeds despair. As the hours tick by, the office becomes a pressure cooker of tension and terror. The assailants' voices grow more agitated, their patience thinning as negotiations drag on. The sound of sirens outside grows more insistent, a promise of rescue that seems agonizingly out of reach. In this crucible of fear, I find my thoughts drifting to memories of normalcy mundane moments I took for granted, laughter shared over coffee, the comfort of my bed. I cling to these fragments of the past, using them as a shield against the horror of my present. They are reminders of a world I fear I may never return to, anchors in the storm that rages around me. Then, amidst the cacophony of fear and chaos, a moment of clarity pierces the darkness. It's the realization that life is a fragile, precious thing, hanging by a thread that can be severed in an instant. This understanding brings a new kind of fear, but also a determination to survive, to hold on to hope even in the face of overwhelming odds. The standoff reaches its climax in a crescendo of noise and movement. The sound of breaking glass shouts, the definitive reports of gunfire it's over in moments, but each second is etched into my memory with the clarity of a nightmare made real. When the authorities finally reach me, pulling me from my hiding place into the light, the relief is overwhelming, but so is the grief for what has been lost. The aftermath is a blur of faces and questions, the reality of the situation settling in with a weight that's hard to bear. The world outside seems different now, colored by the trauma of the day. I'm alive, but the innocence of before is gone, replaced by a knowledge of the darkness that lurks in unexpected places. Story 6 The night, once a blanket of tranquility, is shattered by the sound of breaking glass. A chilling jolt of fear courses through me, the sudden intrusion tearing through the silence like a scream. I'm alone. The realization hitting me with the weight of the darkness that now seems to press in from all sides. Somewhere, within the walls that have always been my sanctuary, someone has made their way inside. My heart races, pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribcage, as every shadow morphs into an enemy, every creak and whisper of the house a signal of the intruder getting closer. The air feels thicker, charged with danger, and I find myself holding my breath listening for any sound that might reveal my presence to the uninvited guest moving through my home. I'm armed with nothing but my wits, the stark reality setting in that I'm woefully unprepared for this nightmare. The phone, my lifeline to the outside world, feels miles away, left carelessly on the living room table in the casualness of an ordinary evening. Now, the thought of making it there to call for help without revealing my position feels like a mission fraught with peril. The house, once a place of comfort and memories, has transformed into a maze of potential ambushes. Every corner turned, every door opened, is a gamble between life and death. I move with a caution born of primal fear, trying to make myself as small and silent as possible. The familiar becomes alien, 
each room a stage for a possible confrontation I'm desperate to avoid. The sounds of the intruder moving through my home are intermittent, jarring in their unpredictability. A drawer opens somewhere, the soft thud of footsteps on the carpet, a whispered curse. Each noise is a pinpoint of location, but also a reminder of the danger I'm in. The psychological torment of not knowing where or when they'll appear is a torture all its own. I find a momentary haven in a closet, the darkness a cloak that I hope hides me from detection. My mind races, cycling through options, scenarios, outcomes. In this cramped space, surrounded by coats and the forgotten clutter of daily life, I attempt to call for help. My hands shake as I dial, the screens glow a beacon I fear will lead the intruder straight to me. The voice on the other end is a lifeline, promising help, urging me to stay hidden, to stay silent. The wait is agonizing. Every minute stretches into an eternity of anticipation and fear. I hear the intruder moving closer, the randomness of their search pattern a noose that seems to tighten with every passing second. The sound of my own breathing seems deafening, and I fight to control the panic that threatens to erupt. Then, a shift. The intruder is near, too near. My heart stops as shadows flicker under the door, the soft tread of footsteps a countdown to discovery. In that moment, the fight-or-flight instinct takes over. The fear, while still present, is joined by a surge of adrenaline, a clarity of thought that is both terrifying and exhilarating. The decision to act, to confront rather than cower, is one born of desperation. Armed with nothing more substantial than determination and the element of surprise, I wait for the opportune moment. The door opens and time slows, the ensuing struggle a blur of motion and noise. It's a dance of survival, each movement, each decision, driven by the raw desire to live. When the authorities finally arrive, the relief is indescribable. The intruder is subdued, the danger past, but the shadow of the night's events lingers. The aftermath is a mix of gratitude, shock, and a profound sense of vulnerability. The house, my home, feels different now tainted by the intrusion, the sense of safety shattered like the glass that marked the beginning of the ordeal. Story 7 The realization comes slowly, then all at once. For the past few days, there's been a presence, a shadow that seems to follow me wherever I go. At first, it's easy to brush off as coincidence. The same car behind me on my daily commute, a glimpse of a figure that feels oddly familiar, it's nothing, I tell myself. But the seed of fear, once planted, begins to grow with each passing day. It starts to become undeniable. The car, nondescript and always a few car lengths behind, is no mere coincidence. I notice it lurking near my home, the same vehicle that seems to shadow me to my workplace. And then, there's the figure, a silhouette, that seems to materialize whenever I'm alone, disappearing whenever I try to confront it or get a better look. The messages begin soon after. At first, they're ambiguous, easily dismissed as wrong numbers or mistaken identities but they escalate quickly, each one more threatening than the last, leaving me with a chilling sense of being watched, targeted. They know things about me, details of my daily routine, my interactions, things I've never shared. It's a violation of my privacy, my sense of security, that leaves me shaken to the core. I go to the police, clutching a folder of messages and photographs of the car that haunts my days and nights but my hope for a swift resolution crumbles when I'm met with sympathetic yet helpless expressions. Without concrete evidence, their hands are tied, and I'm left to fend for myself in a world that suddenly seems full of shadows and danger. The fear becomes a constant companion, whispering in my ear with every step I take. I start to watch over my shoulder, jumping at the slightest sound, the briefest movement in my peripheral vision. My home, once a sanctuary, now feels like a trap. The windows and doors, potential vulnerabilities to be exploited by my unseen tormentor. Paranoia takes root, coloring my interactions with suspicion. 
Friends and colleagues notice the change, the way my eyes dart around rooms, how I flinch at the vibration of my phone. I see the concern in their eyes, the unasked questions about what's happening to me. But how do I explain the terror of being stalked, of feeling preyed upon by someone who refuses to step out of the darkness? The isolation that comes with being stalked is perhaps the cruelest part. It's a solitary kind of fear, one that's difficult to share or explain fully. Those around me try to understand, offering advice and support, but there's a gap in comprehension. They don't see the shadows that move just at the edge of sight, don't feel the prickling of the skin that comes with the sense of being observed. As the days stretch into weeks, the encounters become more brazen. A photograph left where I'll find it, a reminder that they're always watching. A figure that lingers just a bit too long outside my workplace, the sense of eyes on me even in a crowd. It's a psychological game, one designed to wear me down, to keep me off balance and afraid. The climax comes on an ordinary evening that turns into anything but. Returning home, the sense of being followed is stronger than ever. This time I decide to confront it, to face my stalker in an attempt to reclaim some semblance of control over my life. The confrontation is tense, a showdown that feels both terrifying and inevitable. In the end, the resolution is anticlimactic. The stalker, once an ominous presence, is revealed to be nothing more than a person twisted by obsession, yes, but flesh and blood nonetheless. The police are involved, and the legal proceedings begin, a slow process of seeking justice and reclaiming peace. The aftermath of being stalked is a long road to recovery. The fear lingers, a shadow of its former self, but persistent. I find strength in the support of those around me, in the resilience that I was forced to discover within myself. The experience leaves scars, invisible but indelible marks on my psyche. Story 8 The evening had stretched into night, a blanket of darkness enveloping the world around me. My car hummed steadily along the busy highway, the comforting rhythm of the engine and the blur of passing lights a lullaby to the stresses of the day. It was in this tranquil bubble of isolation that my reality abruptly shifted my car began to sputter, an unexpected hiccup in its otherwise smooth performance. A glance at the dashboard sent a jolt of panic through me. The fuel gauge needle was firmly on empty, a detail I had negligently overlooked in my haste to get home. The car's momentum carried me a little further, but it wasn't long before it gave one last feeble shudder and coasted to a stop a silent and inert mass on the edge of the bustling highway. The transformation of my surroundings was instantaneous. The highway, a mere background to my thoughts moments before, now felt alive with danger. The whoosh of passing cars became a roar, their headlights briefly illuminating the interior of my car in stark, sweeping flashes. Each vehicle that zoomed by shook my car slightly, a reminder of my precarious situation. I was alone, in darkness, on a busy highway, with no immediate means of rectification. My phone, my would-be savior in situations such as this, betrayed me with its own lifeless screen another casualty of my unpreparedness. The irony wasn't lost on me in a world so connected I found myself utterly isolated. Panic began to set in, a creeping, insidious thing that wrapped its cold fingers around my heart. The vulnerability of my position struck me with full force. I was a sitting duck, invisible to the speeding lives passing me by, each one a potential harbinger of collision. I attempted to flag down help, stepping out into the chilling embrace of the night with a flashlight I found in the glove compartment. Its weak beam seemed laughable against the vast darkness, a feeble cry for help drowned out by the cacophony of the highway. Time stretched each minute a mounting testament to my helplessness. Then, amidst the symphony of my despair, a glimmer of hope materialized in the form of a highway patrol vehicle. Its lights, a beacon of salvation, pulsed with the promise of safety. The officer, a silhouette against the glare of his headlights, approached with a cautious professionalism that melted into kindness upon assessing my situation. 
The relief that washed over me was palpable, a physical unclenching of fear's tight grip. With the officer's help, my car was safely moved and assistance was called. As I waited in the patrol car, the warmth and the officer's calm presence a stark contrast to the cold vulnerability outside, I had a moment to reflect. My ordeal on the highway, though brief, was a poignant reminder of the fragility of our constructs of safety and control. A simple oversight had left me exposed to the elements and the mercy of passing strangers. It was a lesson in preparedness, in the importance of being aware of our surroundings and the variables that can shift our course in an instant. But more than that, it was a testament to the unexpected kindness that can light our darkest hours. The officer, a guardian of the night's chaotic realm, had been my guide back to safety. His reassurance, the ease with which he navigated my crisis, reminded me that even in our most isolated moments, help can be just a beacon away. As I finally resumed my journey home, the highway once again a river of lights in motion beneath me, I carried with me a newfound appreciation for the thin line between normalcy and chaos. The experience had been a stark confrontation with my own vulnerability, but also a vivid illustration of the strength and kindness that lie at the heart of humanity. Story 9 The crackle of the campfire had lulled me into a peaceful sleep, under a tapestry of stars that stretched endlessly across the night sky. Nestled in the embrace of the wilderness, far from the clamor and rush of city life, I had felt an unparalleled sense of freedom. The air was crisp, carrying the scent of pine and earth, a natural perfume that promised a night of deep, undisturbed rest. It was a perfect end to a day of hiking and exploring, of breathing in the raw beauty of nature. My last thought before sleep claimed me was a reflection on the simple joys of camping, of being disconnected and present in the moment. Dawn broke with a whisper, the first light creeping gently over the horizon, painting the world in hues of gold and pink. The serene beauty of the morning was in stark contrast to the sense of disorientation that greeted me as I stirred from sleep. Blinking the remnants of dreams from my eyes, I gradually became aware of an unsettling silence. The usual morning chorus of birds and the distant rustle of wildlife were there, but something was amiss. The realization hit me like a physical blow, everything was gone. My backpack, with all my provisions and gear, my camera, even the small cooler I had stashed away from the campsite all had vanished into the night. The fire pit, now just a circle of cold ashes, offered no clues, no remnants of disturbance, no footprints in the soft earth around my tent. Panic surged, a rising tide of fear and disbelief. How? Who? The questions spun in my mind, each one more frantic than the last. I was miles from the nearest trailhead, deep in the wilderness, with nothing but the clothes on my back and a dwindling sense of hope. The isolation of the wilderness, once a cherished escape, now felt like a looming threat, an expansive prison with no clear way out. As the initial shock subsided, replaced by a cold determination, I took stock of my situation. Survival training, once theoretical exercises discussed over campfires, became my lifeline. Water, shelter, food, the basics of survival echoed in my head as I set about securing what I could from the natural surroundings. Water was the first priority. I remembered passing a stream the day before, a ribbon of life winding through the forest. Using a makeshift container fashioned from a large leaf, I managed to collect enough to quench the immediate pangs of thirst. Shelter was next. The tent, thankfully, had been deemed unnecessary by my unseen assailants, a small mercy in an otherwise dire situation. It would provide some protection from the elements, but without a sleeping bag, the nights promised to be cold, an ordeal of endurance against the chill that seeped into the very bones. Food was a more daunting challenge. Without my provisions, I was left to rely on the knowledge of edible plants and the hope of stumbling upon a cache of berries or nuts. Each small discovery, each bite of sustenance was a victory against despair, a defiance of the creeping fear that rescue might never come. Days melded into one another, 
a blur of survival and routine. The initial panic had given way to a grim determination, a resolve to endure, to outlast the wilderness that had stripped me of everything but my will to survive. I fashioned crude tools from branches, tied markers to trees to aid potential rescuers, and kept a signal fire ready, its smoke a constant plea for attention. The wilderness, for all its beauty, is indifferent to the struggles of those within its embrace. But in that indifference lies a challenge, a call to rise above circumstance and reclaim a measure of control. Each day brought new trials but also new strengths, an inner resilience forged in the crucible of survival. Rescue when it came was as unexpected as the theft that had stranded me. A search party, alerted by my absence, found me by the signal fire, a beacon of hope that had finally pierced the vastness of the wilderness. The relief of seeing other humans, of hearing voices that weren't echoes of my own, was overwhelming. Story 10 In the heart of a sprawling city, nestled among the steel and glass giants, lay an old, forgotten library. It was a relic from another era, hidden in plain sight, its existence barely acknowledged by the modern world buzzing around it. I stumbled upon it purely by chance, a wrong turn on a day when the city seemed too much, too loud, too fast. The library offered a silent refuge, its heavy wooden doors swinging open with a creak that spoke of age and disuse. Inside, the air was thick with the scent of old paper and leather, a tangible whisper of the countless stories that lay dormant in the dust-covered shelves. The light filtered through stained glass windows, casting the room in a kaleidoscope of colors, breathing life into the shadows. It was in this otherworldly silence that I found it a book unlike any other, its cover worn, its pages yellowed with time. The title was etched in gold, faded but still legible, tales of the forgotten city intrigued. I opened it to the first page, and that's when the magic began. The words leaped off the page, weaving a narrative that pulled me in, a current too strong to resist. I found myself transported to a city within the city, a place that time had overlooked, where the magic of the old world still lingered. This forgotten city was a tapestry of narrow cobblestone streets and ivy-covered walls, a place where mythical creatures roamed freely among the inhabitants. Dragons perched atop the ancient towers, watching over the city with wise, knowing eyes. Fairies danced in the gardens at dusk, their laughter a melody that filled the air with joy. And in the heart of the city a grand castle stood, its spires reaching towards the sky, a testament to the strength and courage of those who dwelled within. As I delved deeper into the story, I realized that the city was not without its shadows. A darkness lurked at the edges, a force that threatened to unravel the fabric of this magical place. The inhabitants lived in harmony, but the peace was fragile, a delicate balance maintained by the guardians of the city, a group of warriors with the power to wield magic. I became a silent observer to their struggles, witnessing their battles against the creeping darkness, their efforts to protect the city they loved. The characters became as real to me as the world outside the library's walls had been, their hopes and fears echoing my own. The tale was one of bravery, of sacrifice, and of the enduring power of community and hope. As the story reached its climax, with the city on the brink of destruction and the Guardians standing defiant against the darkness, I felt a connection so profound it took my breath away. The final pages were a blur of motion and emotion, a battle that raged not just in the city's streets but within the hearts of its defenders. And then, in a moment of stunning clarity and unity, the darkness was vanquished, pushed back by the collective strength and will of the city's inhabitants. Closing the book, I was met with an overwhelming sense of peace. The library around me seemed brighter, the colors through the stained glass windows more vibrant. It was as if the tale had imbued the very air with magic, a reminder of the power of stories to transform, to inspire, to heal. I left the library with the book tucked under my arm, a treasure found in the most unlikely of places. The city outside hadn't changed, but I had. 
The story of the Forgotten City, with its magic and myth, bravery and darkness, had awakened something within me a sense of wonder, a belief in the power of the unseen, the magic that exists in the spaces between. Story 11 The night had worn on, a blur of laughter and music that had pulsed through the crowded spaces of the downtown bar. It was one of those rare evenings where the burdens of daily life seemed to dissolve in the camaraderie of friends and the warmth of dim, flickering lights. As the hours slipped away, unnoticed and uncounted, the time to head home inevitably arrived. The cool night air was a sharp contrast to the muggy warmth of the bar, refreshing and sobering all at once. Walking alone, the streets seemed different than they had just a few hours earlier. Shadows clung to the corners, and the usual buzz of city life had dimmed to a whisper. The familiar route home, often taken without a second thought, now felt laden with a quiet tension, as if the night held its breath. It was then that I noticed it the faint sound of footsteps mirroring my own. At first I told myself it was nothing, just another late night wanderer making their way home. But as I quickened my pace, so too did the footsteps behind me. A glance over my shoulder revealed only the empty street, the occasional street light casting long, distorted shadows across the pavement. The comforting rationalizations that had buffered my initial fear began to erode with every echoing step. Was I being followed? The question, once unthinkable, now hammered in my chest with a rhythm that matched the quickening beat of my heart. Every instinct screamed to run, to escape the unseen presence that seemed to draw closer with every moment. In a bid for safety, I altered my route, turning down a street I seldom traveled, lined with closed shops and darkened windows. The hope was to lose my pursuer, to emerge onto a busier street, where the presence of others might deter whoever stalked me through the night. But still, the footsteps persisted, a relentless echo in the otherwise silent night. Panic, sharp and urgent, clawed at the edges of my calm. The isolation of the streets, once merely quiet and deserted, now felt menacing, as if the very darkness sought to swallow me whole. The realization that I needed to act, to protect myself, was a jolt of clarity amid the swirling fear. With a quick decision, I slipped into the shadowed doorway of an alley, pressing myself against the cool brick and forcing my breath to slow, to quiet. The footsteps approached, then paused, as if considering. My heart pounded, a deafening sound in my ears, threatening to give away my hiding spot. Then, after a moment that stretched into eternity, the footsteps moved on, fading into the night. The relief was palpable, a physical release of tension that left my knees weak. I waited, counting the seconds, until the silence assured me I was once again alone. Emerging from the alley, I made my way home with a cautious speed alert to any sound, any movement. Once safely inside, the door locked firmly behind me, the night's ordeal seemed almost surreal. The fear that had gripped me so completely on the streets outside dissipated in the familiarity of my own space. Yet the experience left a lingering shadow, a reminder of the vulnerability that comes with assuming we are ever truly alone truly safe. Story 12 The fog hung low, a thick blanket that transformed the landscape into a realm of muted shapes and shadows. It was late, the kind of hour where the world seems to hold its breath, and I was miles from anywhere that felt like civilization. The remote road I'd taken as a shortcut wound through the woods, a ribbon of asphalt barely visible in the dim light of my car's headlights. Then, without warning, the engine stuttered and died, coasting to a silent stop. I sat for a moment, disbelief mingling with a rising sense of unease. No signal on my phone, no way to call for help, and no idea what had caused the car to fail. I'd always prided myself on being resourceful, but the isolation of the setting, coupled with the impenetrable fog, lent an eerie quality to the breakdown that I couldn't shake off. With a deep breath, I stepped out into the fog, 
the car's hood cool under my hands as I lifted it. The engine, a maze of metal and wires, offered no obvious answers. I was no mechanic, but I knew the basics. Yet, as I checked connections and looked for anything amiss, a new and unexpected sensation crept over me the feeling of being watched. It started as a whisper, so soft I thought it might be the wind. But there was no wind, just the heavy, still air of the fog. The whispers grew, a chorus of voices that seemed to emerge from the fog itself. They were pleas for help, voices laden with sorrow and fear, growing louder, more insistent. I spun around, my heart racing, but saw nothing in the dense white mist. The realization that the whispers weren't coming from any one direction, but were all around me, sent a shiver down my spine. There was something out there, just beyond the edge of the road, moving in the fog. The visibility was so poor I could barely see a few feet ahead, yet the sensation of movement, of something circling, was undeniable. Panic set in, a primal urge to flee, but to where? My car was a useless shell, the road a path to nowhere in both directions. The voices in the fog called out, louder now, a cacophony of desperation that seemed to pull at me from every side. In that moment, a choice presented itself investigate the source of the whispers or stay with the car in hopes of the fog lifting or another traveler passing by. Driven by a mix of fear and an inexplicable pull toward the voices, I made a decision that would change the course of the night. I followed the whispers, stepping cautiously off the road and into the fog-shrouded woods. Each step seemed to lead me deeper into a world unbound by the laws of nature I understood. The ground beneath my feet felt unstable, the air around me charged with a palpable tension. As I ventured further, the whispers coalesced into clearer voices, guiding me to a clearing where the fog seemed to part like a curtain. In the heart of the clearing was a car, not unlike my own, crashed against a tree. The scene was frozen in time, a tableau of a night gone horribly wrong. The realization hit me with the force of a physical blow the whispers were echoes of a tragedy, voices reaching out from a past that had been swallowed by the fog. The movement I'd sensed was the memory of life, playing out its final moments in an endless loop. I don't know how long I stood there, caught between worlds, but when I returned to my car, the fog had begun to lift. My car started on the first try, as if whatever had held it, and me, in stasis was satisfied with the acknowledgement of its pain. Driving away, the road clear and the night waning, I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd been given a glimpse into something beyond understanding, a moment where the veil between past and present had thinned. The whispers in the fog had been a plea for recognition, for the peace that comes with being remembered. Story 13 the old office building had a reputation for being haunted, but I never paid much attention to those stories. That was, until one winter night when I was working late to meet a deadline. The building was old, with creaky floors and a moan to the wind that seeped through the cracks in the windows, making it feel like the structure itself was alive with a quiet, unsettling breath. It was past midnight, and the only light came from my desk lamp casting long shadows that danced across the room. I was typing away when a sudden chill made me shiver. It was then that I heard it a child's laughter, light and airy, echoing through the empty halls. I paused, my hands hovering over the keyboard as I listened. The sound was out of place, hauntingly joyful in the silence of the night. No one should have been in the building at this hour, let alone a child. Curiosity peaked, and a sense of unease growing within me, I got up from my desk to investigate. The laughter continued, a playful giggle that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere all at once. Hello. I called out, my voice sounding alien in the quiet. The laughter responded, a direct challenge beckoning me forward. I followed the sound down the hallway, past darkened offices filled with the ghosts of daytime hustle. The laughter led me deeper into the building, towards the old archive room at the far end of the far end of the floor. It was a part of the office seldom used, 
filled with rows upon rows of dusty files and forgotten records. As I approached, the laughter grew louder, a clear invitation to play a game of hide-and-seek. I'm coming to find you, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. The words felt foolish, but the laughter urged me on, a few steps ahead, always just out of sight. I reached the archive room and hesitated at the door. The air felt colder here, the shadows deeper. I pushed the door open, and the laughter stopped abruptly, replaced by a deafening silence. The room was empty, save for the files and the moonlight filtering through the grimy window. I stood there, heart pounding, feeling both relieved and disappointed. Had I imagined the whole thing? Then from behind me, a whisper you're getting warmer, I spun around, but the hallway was empty. The voice was playful yet eerie, a stark contrast to the silence that had just enveloped me. The game was on, and I was it, whether I liked it or not. Drawn forward by a mix of fear and determination, I moved through the building, following the voice as it led me on a winding path. It felt like I was being drawn deeper into a web, each turn and each whispered clue pulling me further away from the safety of my office. At one point, I thought I saw a shadow dart across the end of the hallway, small and quick, but when I reached the spot, there was nothing. Just the echo of my own footsteps and the distant sound of the city outside, as if the world were carrying on, oblivious to the oddity occurring within these walls. The game continued, the child's voice always a few steps ahead, luring me into the abandoned parts of the building I'd never had cause to visit. The laughter had taken on a different tone now, not as light, carrying a hint of something I couldn't quite place was it malice, or perhaps sadness. As I ventured deeper, the air grew colder, and the atmosphere thickened. It felt as though the very fabric of reality was warping, the line between the living and the spectral blurring. I could feel something in the air, a palpable sense of anticipation, as if the building itself were holding its breath, waiting for the climax of this strange nocturnal intrusion. That's when I found the staircase leading down to the basement, a place I'd only heard about in hushed tones from the old timers at the office. They said it was used during the war, a shelter perhaps, or something darker. The laughter led me there, to the top of the stairs, where the light from above seemed to fear to tread. Stealing myself, I began the descent. Each step creaked under my weight, a stark reminder of the age of the building and the possible secrets it held within its bowels. The air grew colder, denser, as if trying to smother the life out of me. The laughter had ceased, replaced by a silence so profound it felt like a physical force pushing against me, urging me back, warning me to go no further. But I couldn't turn back now. The mystery of the child's voice the laughter in the dead of night it had ensnared my curiosity, binding me to this game of hide and seek. I needed to know, to understand what was happening, even as every instinct screamed at me to flee. At the bottom of the stairs I found myself in a long, narrow hallway, the air thick with dust and the scent of decay. Dim light bulbs, few and far between, cast sickly pools of light along the path. The doors lining the hallway were heavy steel and locked with small, barred windows at eye level. As I moved forward, a chill ran down my spine. The atmosphere was charged, as if something unseen watched me from the shadows. Then, a soft thud echoed through the corridor, followed by the sound of something dragging. My heart raced, adrenaline coursing through my veins. The child's voice whispered, closer now almost there. The direction was unclear, but it seemed to emanate from one of the doors. Tentatively, I approached, peering through the barred window of the nearest door. Inside, the room was shrouded in darkness, save for the moonlight that struggled through a small, grimy window high on the wall. And then, I saw it a shadow, small and indistinct, moving across the room. My breath caught in my throat. Hello, I whispered, my voice barely audible. No answer, just the sound of something moving in the dark. 
I tried the door, half expecting it to be locked, but to my surprise, it swung open with a loud creak. The air inside was colder, a stark contrast to the hallway. My eyes struggled to adjust to the darkness, but I could feel the presence of something in the room with me. As I stepped forward, the moonlight revealed its secrets a room that hadn't seen use in years, filled with old furniture covered in dust sheets. And there, in the corner, the vague outline of a child sitting on the floor, head bowed. My heart went out to the figure, and I stepped closer, reaching out. Are you okay? What are you doing here? My voice was gentle, trying not to frighten the child. But as I drew nearer, the figure lifted its head, and the moonlight fell upon its face. My blood turned to ice. The face was wrong, too old, eyes too deep, and mouth stretched into a grin that was anything but joyful. Fear gripped me, a primal terror that rooted me to the spot. This was no child. The laughter returned, a chilling sound that filled the room, echoing around me, mocking. The figure stood, taller now, and I realized the truth of the game it had led me here, into the darkness, not to find but to be found. I turned to run, but the door slammed shut with a force that shook the room. The laughter grew louder, the room spinning, the shadows closing in. Desperation lent me strength and I threw myself against the door, pounding, screaming for help that I knew wouldn't come. Then, as suddenly as it had begun, the laughter stopped. The pressure lifted, the air cleared, and the door swung open. I stumbled out into the hallway, gasping for breath, the echo of my own heartbeat deafening in my ears. I didn't look back as I ran, up the stairs, through the building, and out into the night. The cold air of the outside world was a balm to my senses, but the terror of what I'd experienced clung to me, a reminder of the night I played a game of hide and seek with something that was never a child. The building loomed behind me, silent now, its secrets locked away in the dark. I never worked late in that building again, and in time I left the job, unable to shake the feeling of being watched, of laughter just on the edge of hearing. But the memory of that night remains, a chilling reminder that some games are better left unplayed. Story 14 the cabin had always been my escape, a rustic retreat nestled in the heart of the woods, far from the chaos of city life. It was a place of solitude, where the only sounds were the whisper of the wind through the trees and the occasional distant call of a wild animal. This time, however, my visit was marked by a discovery that would change the very nature of my sanctuary. On a day that had been spent wandering the woods, I returned to the cabin as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple. The chill in the air hinted at the approach of night, and I hastened inside, eager for the warmth of the fire. As I settled in, a curiosity to explore the old cabin further led me to a heavy, wooden drawer in the living room that I had never bothered to open before. Inside, hidden beneath a layer of dust and forgotten trinkets, was a small, leather-bound diary, its cover worn and its lock rusted shut. My initial attempt to open it was met with resistance, but undeterred and driven by a burgeoning curiosity, I fetched a small tool from the kitchen and managed to break the lock. The diary creaked open, revealing yellowed pages filled with neat, looping handwriting. The entries dated back decades, penned by someone who once sought the same solace in these woods as I did. But as I delved deeper into the diary, the tone shifted from serene reflections on nature to a growing obsession with the idea that they were not alone. The writer spoke of feeling eyes on them from the shadows of the trees, of hearing whispers on the wind that were too coherent to be mere figments of imagination. With each entry, their paranoia escalated, transforming their haven into a prison of their own mind. They wrote of shadows that moved against the natural sway of branches, of figures that appeared and vanished in the blink of an eye. 
The diary ended abruptly, the final entry a frantic scrawl of someone pushed to the brink of madness, convinced they were being watched, hunted by something in the woods. A shiver ran down my spine as I closed the diary, the echo of the writer's fear resonating within me. I tried to laugh it off, to convince myself that the isolation had simply gotten to them, but a seed of doubt had been planted. That night as I lay in bed, the wind seemed to carry a different note, a whispering that was almost human. Unable to sleep, I found myself staring out the window at the forest that bordered the cabin. The moon, full and bright, cast a silvery glow over the trees, giving them an ethereal quality. But as I watched, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me in return, hidden in the darkness beyond. Then, the shadows began to move. Not with the natural sway of tree branches in the wind, but in a deliberate manner, creeping along the ground, stretching towards the cabin. My heart raced, the diary's words echoing in my mind, blurring the line between rationality and the infectious paranoia contained. With every shadow that seemed to twitch against the logic of light, the fear grew, wrapping its cold fingers around my heart. I was torn between the desire to flee and the irrational urge to venture into the woods to confront whatever might be lurking in the darkness. The night stretched on, each minute a battle between my waning rationality and the burgeoning terror that clawed at the edges of my mind. The shadows outside seemed to pulse with a life of their own, an undulating dance that beckoned me to join them in the darkness. With the diary's words as a haunting backdrop, the line between reality and the paranoia described became increasingly blurred. Compelled by a mixture of fear and an insatiable need for answers, I dressed and grabbed a flashlight, deciding to confront whatever mysteries lay hidden under the cover of night. As I stepped outside, the cool air hit me like a physical force, the forest's nocturnal chorus rising to a crescendo as if to mark my passage. The beam of my flashlight cut through the darkness, a solitary lifeline in the oppressive gloom of the woods. I ventured further, the cabin's comforting glow receding behind me, swallowed by the night. The ground beneath my feet crunched softly, the only sound amidst the eerie silence that had fallen over the forest. As I moved deeper into the woods, the feeling of being watched intensified. I spun around, the flashlight's beam darting from tree to tree, revealing nothing but the natural chaos of the forest. Yet the sensation persisted, a primal warning system screaming that I was not alone. Suddenly a figure emerged from the shadows so briefly that I doubted my own eyes. It was gone in an instant, leaving only a lingering sense of unease and the unmistakable feeling of being prey. My breath caught in my throat, and for a moment I was paralyzed, caught in the primal fear of the hunted. Shaking off the terror, I pressed on, driven by a need to understand, to prove to myself that there was a rational explanation for everything I had experienced. The diary's words, once a source of eerie fascination, now felt like a prophecy foretelling my own descent into madness. The woods seemed to close in around me, the trees whispering secrets in a language I could not understand. My flashlight flickered, casting long shadows that danced and twisted in the dark. Heart pounding, I pushed forward, until I came upon a clearing I had never seen before. In the center of the clearing stood an old, gnarled tree, its branches bare and twisted, reaching towards the sky like the fingers of a skeletal hand. Beneath it, a small, makeshift altar of stones, atop which lay objects that seemed out of place in the natural setting a child's doll, its eyes missing a collection of bones, small and delicately arranged in a book, its cover worn and faded. I approached the altar, a sense of dread building with each step. The book, upon closer inspection, was a diary, its pages filled with the same looping handwriting I had seen before. But this diary was older, the entries dating back further, chronicling the experiences of someone who had once lived in the cabin, consumed by the same paranoia, the same fear of being watched. The realization hit me like a wave the diary I had found was not the first. 
There had been others before, each succumbing to the madness that now threatened to engulf me. The forest, with its moving shadows and whispering winds, had been a witness to it all, a silent participant in a cycle of fear and obsession that spanned generations. I turned to leave, the weight of the discovery heavy on my soul, when the shadows began to move again, this time encircling me, drawing closer with an almost palpable malice. The wind picked up, carrying with it the sound of laughter, light and mocking, as if the forest itself reveled in my terror. In that moment I understood the forest was alive, not in the sense of flora and fauna, but with a consciousness, an awareness that had observed, waited, and now acted. The diaries were not warnings, they were invitations, drawing the curious and the brave into a game that had no end, only madness. With a final burst of adrenaline, I broke through the encircling shadows, running blindly towards the safety of the cabin. I did not stop to look back, knowing that some mysteries are better left unsolved, some shadows better left unexplored. I left the cabin at dawn, the diary tucked away, a memento of a night that had forever changed my understanding of fear. The forest remained behind, a silent sentinel that watched as I drove away, its secrets hidden in the shadows, waiting for the next unwitting player in its ancient game. Story 15 the day had started like any other dedicated to the altruistic task of a beach cleanup. The sun was a gentle caress against the skin, the sea a soothing presence, its waves whispering promises of renewal and purity. We armed with bags and gloves, our group of volunteers spread across the sandy expanse, united in our mission to reclaim the beauty of nature from the clutches of human neglect. As I made my way along the shoreline, Picking up the remnants of human indifference, my attention was caught by an unusual object partially buried in the sand. It was a crate, old and weathered by time and salt water, its wood splintered but still sturdy. Curiosity overrode my initial hesitation, and I called over a couple of fellow volunteers to help me pry it open. The crate resisted our efforts, as if guarding its contents jealously but eventually the lid gave way with a groan of protest. Inside, nestled among straw that seemed oddly fresh for such an ancient container, lay a collection of objects that sent a chill down my spine. They were medical instruments, but unlike any I had seen before bizarre in shape and ominous in appearance, crafted from cold metal and stained with what I could only hope was rust. Beneath this macabre assortment lay a journal, its leather cover worn and pages yellowed with age. I lifted it with a sense of foreboding, turning it over in my hands. The journal fell open to a page marked by a dark, dried flower, revealing neat, meticulous handwriting that detailed experiments so horrifying, they seemed born of a twisted imagination rather than scientific pursuit. The experiments described in the journal were conducted on humans, or at least, beings that once resembled humans. The entry spoke of modifications, of attempts to push beyond the natural limits of the human body, to create something new, something other. The language was clinical, detached, but beneath the surface lay a current of madness, a descent into obsession with transcending humanity itself. As I absorbed the contents of the journal, a sound from within the crate snapped me back to reality a rustling as if something were shifting in the shadows cast by the afternoon sun. A wave of horror washed over me, the realization dawning that the experiments detailed in the journal might not have been confined to its pages. With a trembling hand, I shone my flashlight into the crate's depths, half expecting to uncover a nightmare. The light revealed the crate was deeper than I had thought, its sides extending into the sand, creating a dark cavity. The rustling came again, more insistent this time, and something moved within the shadows, something that was unmistakably alive. The beach, once a place of beauty and tranquility, had transformed in a moment into a scene from a horror story. The sea's whispers turned sinister, the sun's warmth overshadowed by the cold grip of fear. I stood frozen, caught between the urge to flee and the compelling need to understand the full scope of the crate's secrets. 
With my heart pounding in my chest, I braced myself for the worst. The rustling grew louder, more desperate, as if aware of my attention. I leaned closer, the flashlight's beam piercing the darkness, revealing a pair of eyes that glinted from the shadows. But they were not the eyes of a monster, they were human, or at least they appeared to be. The figure huddled in the corner of the crate was small, emaciated, its body covered in tattered remnants of clothing. As the light touched its face, it shielded its eyes with a hand that was all too human, its voice a mere whisper, please, no more light. My fear momentarily gave way to confusion and a profound sadness. This was no creature, this was a victim, a living testament to the horrors detailed in the journal. The realization that the experiments had borne fruit, a surviving subject, was a truth more horrifying than any monster I could have imagined. With a newfound resolve, I reached out, offering my hand in a gesture of comfort. It's okay. You're safe now. I'm not going to hurt you, the figure recoiled at first, but desperation overcame fear, and a trembling hand met mine. Together, we carefully extricated the survivor from the crate, the beach around us bathed in the orange hue of the setting sun, a stark contrast to the darkness we had uncovered. The other volunteers gathered around, their expressions a mix of horror and disbelief as I explained the situation. We wrapped the survivor in blankets and provided water, the basics of human kindness feeling like an inadequate response to the depth of suffering experienced. As we waited for the authorities to arrive, I flipped through the journal once more, the entries now carrying the weight of reality. Each word was a condemnation, not just of the individual who had penned them, but of a society that could give birth to such cruelty. The experiments were not the work of a lone madman member funded, supported by those who saw the ends as justifying the means, no matter the cost in human suffering. The arrival of the police and paramedics marked the end of our involvement, but the beginning of a larger investigation. The survivor was taken to a hospital, their condition stable but their future uncertain. As for the crate, it was seized as evidence the instruments and the journal key pieces in unraveling the full extent of the atrocities. In the days that followed, the beach cleanup resumed, but the shadow of the crate lingered over us. The media descended, hungry for the story, but we were left with the reality a reminder of the darkness that can hide beneath the veneer of civilization, washed up on the shores of our conscience. I returned to the beach one last time before leaving, standing at the water's edge as the waves lapped gently at my feet. The sea, timeless and indifferent, carried on, but I was changed. The journal, the survivor, the crate they were now part of my story a haunting testament to the capacity for human cruelty and the resilience of the human spirit. The sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in shades of fire and blood, a backdrop that seemed fitting for the end of this tale. But it was also a beginning, a call to vigilance and compassion in the face of darkness. For in the end, it is not the monsters we find in crates that define us, but our response to them the light we choose to shine into the shadows. Story 16 The allure of the unknown has always been a powerful force in my life, drawing me to places others would avoid. So when rumors reached me of a cursed shipwreck off the coast, said to be the final resting place of a crew who met a mysterious and tragic end, I was intrigued. The ship, named the Mariana's Whisper, was a merchant vessel lost to the sea over a century ago, its wreck recently uncovered by a violent storm. Legends spoke of it being cursed, haunted by the souls of those who perished aboard, forever trapped in a watery grave. Equipped with diving gear and a waterproof flashlight, I set out at dawn, the sea calm and welcoming. Locating the wreck was easier than I expected it lay in shallow waters, its mass protruding like a beckoning finger from the sea. The sun, high in the sky, illuminated the waters, granting me clear visibility as I descended towards the ghostly silhouette on the ocean floor. The Mariana's whisper was a breathtaking sight, a snapshot of history preserved beneath the waves, 
Its hull was encrusted with coral, and schools of fish darted through the broken masts and gaping portholes. But as I approached, a chill swept through me, the water around the wreck seemingly colder, as if the sea itself wished to ward off intruders. Ignoring the ominous feeling, I swam into the heart of the wreck, my flashlight cutting through the darkness, revealing the remnants of the ship's once grand interior. It was as if the Mariana's whisper was suspended in time, waiting for someone to uncover its secrets. That's when I realized the tide was turning, the sea growing restless. I decided to begin my ascent, but as I turned to leave, a current swept through the wreck, blocking my path and trapping me inside. Panic set in as I realized the tide was rising, the water within the wreck rising with it. The walls of the ship groaned under the pressure, a haunting symphony of creaks and moans that mimicked the sounds of a distressed vessel fighting against the sea. It was then that I heard them the whispers. Faint at first, like the rustling of silk, then growing clearer, more pronounced. The voices of the long-dead crew enveloped me, their words tinged with salt and sorrow, recounting the tale of their final voyage. They spoke of a storm, sudden and fierce, that had caught them unawares, the sky turning black as night. The captain, a man of considerable experience, fought valiantly against the tempest, but the sea was merciless. The crew's whispers grew frantic, reliving their desperate attempts to save the Mariana's whisper from being claimed by the ocean's depths. I listened, captivated and horrified, as they described the water invading the ship, the chaos that ensued as men scrambled for lifeboats, only to find them destroyed by the storm's fury. The voices became a chorus of despair, recounting their realization that there was no escape, that the curse they had laughed off was real, a vengeful specter that had come to claim them. As the water level within the wreck rose, threatening to swallow me as it had the crew, I felt an inexplicable connection to these lost souls. Their story, their final, doomed voyage, unfolded around me and I understood that I was not just an intruder, but a witness to their tragedy, chosen to hear their tale so that it might not be lost to the depths. Embarking on an expedition to explore a shipwreck rumored to be cursed was, in hindsight, an endeavor that flirted too closely with the precipice of the unknown. The allure of the ship, said to have vanished under mysterious circumstances only to be discovered years later, anchored eternally in its watery grave, proved irresistible. Its history was a tapestry of tragedy and unexplained phenomena, woven from tales of a crew that vanished into thin air, leaving behind a vessel untouched by time and decay. As I descended into the depths, the ocean around me grew darker, the light from above fading into a distant memory. The shipwreck loomed before me, a behemoth encrusted with coral and barnacles, its structure an eerie silhouette against the abyssal backdrop. My heart raced with a mixture of fear and excitement as I made my way inside, the beam of my flashlight cutting through the murky darkness, revealing a world suspended in time. The interior of the ship was hauntingly preserved, personal effects scattered as if their owners would return at any moment. As I ventured deeper, the tide began to rise, a slow but inexorable force that soon made my retreat impossible. Panic set in as I realized I was trapped, the water level climbing with each passing minute, turning the ship into a tomb. It was then, amidst the growing fear of my impending doom, that I heard at the groaning of the ship's walls, a lament for the souls it encased, accompanied by the whispering of voices. The voices of the long-dead crew, their words a murmur on the edge of comprehension, recounting tales of their final voyage, a journey that had led them to this watery grave. The whispers swirled around me, a chorus of the damned, each voice a strand in the ship's tragic narrative. They spoke of violent storms, of a compass that spun endlessly, unable to find true north, and of the creeping madness that took hold as their fate became clear. The ship, they claimed, was cursed, a plaything of the sea, destined to wander the depths, its crew condemned to relive their final moments for eternity. 
As the water rose, so too did the intensity of the whispers. I could hear the captain, his voice laden with despair, ordering his crew to abandon ship, even as he knew it was too late. The terror of the passengers, their pleas for salvation merging with the sound of the sea as it claimed them, their spirits bound to the vessel that had been their downfall. Trapped with the tide my relentless enemy, I fought to keep my rising panic at bay. The whispers became a cacophony, the past and present blurring as the spirits of the crew enveloped me, their stories becoming mine. The distinction between observer and participant faded, and I found myself caught in the loop of their eternal voyage, a witness to the curse that held them bound to the depths. In a desperate bid for escape, I pushed against the weight of the water, my movements slow and labored. The ship seemed to sense my intent, its structure groaning in protest, the voices rising to a crescendo, as if urging me to accept my fate and join them in their endless drift through the dark. But the human will to survive is a powerful force, and in a moment of clarity I found a way out, a narrow passage that promised freedom. With the last of my strength, I propelled myself towards it, the voices of the crew echoing in my ears, a haunting farewell as I broke free from the ship's grasp and emerged into the open water, the surface tantalizingly close. As I surfaced gasping for air, the sun broke through the clouds, its light a stark contrast to the darkness below. The shipwreck and the voices it housed receded into the depths, a chilling reminder of the thin veil that separates the living from the lost. Story 17 The forest had always been a place of solitude for me, a sanctuary where the only sounds were the rustle of leaves and the distant call of birds. That day I ventured deeper than I had ever gone before, drawn by the allure of undiscovered trails and the peace that came from being away from the world. As the sun began its descent, casting long shadows through the dense canopy, I stumbled upon a clearing that I had never seen on any map. In the heart of this clearing lay an old graveyard, overgrown and seemingly forgotten by time. The iron gate creaked on its hinges as I pushed it open, the sound disturbingly loud in the silence of the forest. Inside, the graves were shrouded in ivy and moss, the names on the tombstones barely legible. Yet, as I brushed away the years of neglect, a chilling detail emerged each stone marked a death on the same day, decades ago as if an entire community had been wiped out in a single, tragic event. A sense of unease began to settle over me, the tranquility of the forest replaced by a whispering tension that seemed to emanate from the graves themselves. The air grew colder, a mist rising from the ground as dusk fell, wrapping the graveyard in an ethereal veil. Then, from somewhere deep within the woods, a bell tolled. Its sound was clear and resonant, cutting through the silence with a solemnity that felt almost sacred. The bell tolled again, and then again, each peal counting down, echoing through the trees, as if signaling something's approach. Intrigued and unnerved in equal measure, I followed the sound, moving deeper into the forest. The bell's tolling became a beacon, guiding my steps through the underbrush, drawing me closer to its source. The forest around me seemed to hold its breath, the usual sounds of wildlife silenced, as if in anticipation. As the final rays of sunlight disappeared, swallowed by the encroaching night, the bell tolled a final time, its note lingering in the air before fading into a heavy silence. I found myself in another clearing, smaller than the first, at its center, an ancient bell tower, ivy-clad and leaning slightly as though burdened by its own age. The door to the tower was ajar, inviting or warning, I could not tell. As I approached, the temperature dropped sharply, my breath forming clouds in the cold air. Inside, the tower was empty save for the bell, its metal surface cold and unyielding. Yet, there was no mechanism in sight, nothing to explain how it had told. That's when I heard it, the whispering. Soft at first, then growing in intensity, the voices of the dead, recounting tales of their lives, their sudden deaths, and the curse that bound them to this place. 
They spoke of a darkness that had descended upon their community, of a malevolent force that had claimed them, one by one, until none were left. The stories were fragmented, broken snippets of fear and despair, but the message was clear. They were warning me, pleading with me to flee before whatever fate had befallen them could claim another victim. Emboldened by the tales of the past and a burning curiosity that overshadowed my fear, I decided to delve deeper into the mystery. The voices grew silent, as if the recounting of their demise had exhausted their ability to communicate with the living. Yet, their final whispers lingered in my mind, a cautionary tale that steeled my resolve rather than deterring me. The cold within the bell tower deepened, a physical manifestation of the darkness that had once swept through this land. With no visible source for the bell's tolling, I turned my attention back to the graveyard, feeling a connection between it, the bell, and the approaching night. As darkness enveloped the forest, an eerie luminescence began to emanate from the graves, casting a ghastly glow over the clearing. The air grew thick with anticipation, the silence of the night broken only by the sound of my own heartbeat, thunderous in my ears. Then, without warning, the bell tolled once more its sound not from the tower now, but as if from everywhere and nowhere resonating within my very bones. With each toll, the light from the graves grew brighter, revealing the outlines of figures emerging from the mist spectral forms, their features blurred, yet unmistakably human. These were the inhabitants of the graveyard, the victims of the curse that had consigned them to this fate. They moved towards me, not with malice, but with a purpose that was both terrifying and tragic. As they drew closer, the air filled with their whispers, now a cacophony of voices that narrated their final moments, their voices overlapping in a desperate bid to be heard. The bell tolled a final time, and the forest fell silent, the spectral forms pausing as if the sound had tethered them to this moment. I realized then that the tolling was not a countdown to something's approach, but a call to the dead, a summoning of their spirits to recount the tragedy that had befallen them, to relive their doom in an endless cycle of despair. In their whispers, I discerned the heart of the curse a betrayal that had led to their downfall, a pact with a darkness that had promised salvation but had delivered only destruction. The curse was not of their making, but it was their legacy a chain that bound them to this place, to this endless repetition of their final night. As the realization dawned upon me, the spectral figures began to fade, their light dimming as they retreated back into the mist, their whispers trailing off into silence. They had shared their tale, a warning across the ages, and now their brief connection to the living world was severed once more. I was left alone in the clearing, the weight of the night heavy upon me. The bell tower stood silent, a sentinel over the lost souls it had summoned. The curse, it seemed, was both a punishment and a prison, its origins lost to time, but its effects felt by each generation that dared to tread too close. As I made my way back through the forest, the first light of dawn began to break over the horizon, casting the night's events into the realm of shadows and doubts. Yet, the whispers of the dead lingered in my mind, a haunting melody that spoke of tragedy, betrayal, and the unending quest for redemption. Story 18 The library was ancient, its walls lined with shelves that reached towards a ceiling lost in shadows, each book a bearer of forgotten knowledge. I had been drawn to this place by tales of its vast collection, rumored to contain works so rare and powerful. They were said to bend the very fabric of reality. As I wandered its aisles, the air thick with the scent of aged paper and dust, a particular tome caught my eye. It was not the most ornate on the shelf, nor the largest, but it emanated a warmth that seemed to pulse gently, like the beating of a heart. With a reverent hand, I retrieved the book, its cover plain and unmarked. Opening it, I was met with pages filled with symbols that defied comprehension, swirling before my eyes in patterns that danced and twisted, refusing to be understood. The warmth of the pages seeped into my skin, 
a comforting heat that belied the unease that began to take root in my mind. Despite my efforts, the meaning of the symbols eluded me, slipping through my grasp like shadows at dusk. That night, as I lay in bed, the day's discoveries replaying in my mind, the symbols from the book began to appear in my vision. They flickered at the edges of my sight, elusive yet persistent, drawing me from the comfort of sleep into a state of restless anticipation. It was as if the book had imprinted itself upon my very being, its mysteries reaching out to me beyond the confines of its pages. Compelled by a force I could not resist, I left my apartment, following the symbols that beckoned me forward. They led me through the city streets, not at random, but with purpose, guiding me to forgotten and hidden places. Alleys and doorways, long overlooked by those who walked these paths daily, revealed themselves to me, each marked by the symbols, pulsating gently in the night. As I delved deeper into the city's secrets, the urban landscape transformed. The modern facade of buildings and streets gave way to older, more ancient structures, their true forms unmasked by the symbols that served as my guide. It was as if I were peeling back layers of time, revealing the city's hidden heart, a place where the past and present converged. The chase led me to an abandoned subway station, its entrance concealed beneath the roots of a towering, ancient tree. The symbols glowed brightly here, illuminating a path down into the depths. The air grew colder as I descended, the sounds of the city above fading into a distant echo, replaced by the whisper of unseen presences that seemed to murmur in the shadows. Emboldened by the otherworldly pursuit and driven by a thirst for knowledge that outweighed my fear, I ventured further into the depths of the forgotten subway station. The air here was thick with a sense of anticipation, as if the very stones were aware of my intrusion into this slumbering sanctum of the city's past. The symbols continued to guide me, now pulsating with an intensity that painted the derelict walls in a tapestry of moving light. Deeper into the station, the path twisted into a labyrinth of tunnels, each turn guided by the arcane symbols. They seemed to whisper in a language beyond words, urging me on, promising answers yet veiling their true intent. The further I traveled, the more I felt the weight of unseen eyes upon me, a scrutiny born from the shadows themselves. Eventually I emerged into a vast underground chamber, its architecture a blend of styles too ancient to place, a monument to epochs long since eroded by the sands of time. At the chamber's center stood a dais, and upon it, a pedestal cradling a tome that mirrored the one I had found in the library, yet undeniably different. This book radiated a power so intense, it was as though the air around it shimmered with a heat mirage. Be compelled by an irresistible force, I approached the dais. The symbols in my vision coalesced around the book, their dance frenetic, almost celebratory. As my hand touched the tome's cover, the chamber was filled with a blinding light, and the symbols etched themselves into the very fabric of my being, their warmth the searing blaze that consumed all doubt, all fear. When the light dimmed, the chamber had changed. The walls were lined with frescoes that depicted the city's history as never before seen, secrets of its founding, of rises and falls, of betrayals and sacrifices that had shaped its destiny. The symbols had not just led me on a chase through the city, they had guided me through the layers of its soul, revealing the truths that lay buried beneath centuries of silence. With the knowledge granted by the symbols, I understood that the city was a nexus of power, a focal point for the forces that danced at the edge of reality. The book in the library, and its twin in this hidden chamber, were keys to unlocking that power, guardians of the balance between worlds. The symbols were not merely a guide, they were an invitation to partake in the ancient covenant that bound the city's fate to the cosmos. As dawn broke above the city, the symbols faded from my vision, their task complete. I emerged from the subway, the first light of morning painting the streets in hues of gold and amber. The city around me looked the same, yet forever altered in my eyes. The secrets it harbored, the history it whispered, were now a part of me 
a sacred trust to be guarded. The book from the library remained in my possession, its pages no longer warm, the symbols still as incomprehensible as before, yet now filled with a benign presence. It was a reminder of the journey I had undertaken, of the truths unveiled, and the mysteries that still lay hidden, waiting for the next seeker brave or foolish enough to follow the symbol's call. Story 19 The old house had stood vacant for years, its stories and secrets locked away behind peeling paint and boarded up windows. When I acquired it, my intention was to breathe new life into the aging structure, to restore its forgotten beauty. The renovation began as a labor of love, each layer of wallpaper and floorboard peeled away revealing the history of those who had dwelled within its walls. It was during this process as I was tearing down a particularly stubborn section of drywall that I made a discovery which would forever alter my perception of the home I was striving to save. Behind the wall, hidden from the world, was a room. Its existence was a mystery omitted from the house's blueprints and unknown to the local historians I had consulted about the property. The air inside was stale, thick with dust, and as I stepped across the threshold, I felt an immediate heaviness, a palpable sense of despair that clung to my skin like a cold mist. The room was small, claustrophobic, with no windows to offer light or escape. Its walls were covered in hundreds, perhaps thousands, of scratch tally marks, each one a silent testament to the hours spent within this hidden space. At the center of the room stood a solitary chair, facing a large, ornate mirror that seemed out of place in such a Spartan setting. The mirror's surface was dull with age, yet as I approached, I could not shake the feeling that it was watching me, its reflective gaze holding secrets of its own. Compelled by a mixture of dread and curiosity, I sat in the chair, the wood creaking under my weight. The view from this vantage point was unsettling a reflection not just of myself but of the room behind me, the tally mark stretching into infinity in the mirror's surface. It was as if the mirror served as a portal to another dimension, one where time and hope were suspended. The longer I sat, the more I became aware of the emotions that permeated the room. It was as though the walls themselves were saturated with the essence of whoever had spent countless hours here, watching, waiting for something, or someone that never came. The air felt charged with a mixture of anticipation and sorrow, a cocktail of feelings that left me breathless and uneasy. As dusk approached, the room seemed to change. The shadows cast by the setting sun danced across the walls and the tally marks appeared to move, their edges blurring and shifting as if alive. The mirror, too, took on a life of its own, the reflection warping, showing glimpses of faces and scenes that were not my own. Whispers filled the air, voices so faint I thought them to be the product of my imagination, yet unmistakably there, recounting tales of loneliness, of vigil, of a watch that had stretched across the years. As the whispers grew louder, a story began to unfold, not through words but through emotions and fragmented visions that played out in the mirror's surface. These were not my reflections but those of a previous occupant, a woman whose presence still permeated the room. She sat in the chair day after day, her eyes locked on the mirror, waiting for a sign, a glimpse of someone lost to her, someone she believed would return to her through the looking glass. The tally marks, I realized, were her way of marking the passing days, a ritual that anchored her to the world even as she slipped further from its grasp. Each mark was a day spent in hopeful vigil, a day that ended in despair. Yet she persisted, driven by a love or obsession that defied time and logic. The sun dipped below the horizon, and the room darkened, the mirror's whispers growing more insistent. In the gloom, the mirror no longer reflected the room but a series of shifting scenes that told the woman's tale. I saw her first arrival in the room, vibrant and full of life, and then, as days turned to years, the light fading from her eyes, her hope replaced by an eternal waiting. It was then that I felt it an overwhelming surge of emotion, a connection that spanned the years, linking me to the woman and her endless watch. 
The mirror had been her portal, a window through which she had hoped to reconnect with her lost love, and now it was offering me the same glimpse into the past, a chance to understand her plight, to share in her vigil. As the night deepened, the visions in the mirror grew more vivid, the woman's presence beside me almost palpable. I could feel her desperation, her longing for closure, for the peace that had eluded her in life. It became clear that the room, the chair, the mirror were all part of a ritual that had bound her spirit to this place, a liminal space between worlds where she waited for a reunion that never came. The realization was a weight, a responsibility that I had not anticipated when I began the renovation of the old house. The woman's story, her unending weight, had become my burden, her hopes and fears now interwoven with my own. The hidden room was a chamber of echoes, of lives suspended in time, waiting for release. As dawn broke, the visions faded, and the mirror's surface stilled, once again reflecting only the tangible world. The woman's presence receded, leaving behind a silence that was both a relief and a sorrow. I knew then that I could not simply seal the room away, forget the revelations of the night. The woman, and the countless hours she had spent in that chair, deserved to be remembered, her story acknowledged. In the days that followed, I dedicated myself to uncovering the truth of the hidden room and its occupant. Through research and inquiries, I pieced together her story, one of love lost to war, of a promise to return that was broken not by faithlessness, but by fate. The house, her home, had been her sanctuary, and the hidden room her refuge, a place where she could keep the vigil for her beloved without the world's prying eyes. I decided to preserve the room as a memorial, a testament to her story and to the power of love and loss. The tally marks remained, each one a symbol of hope and heartache, and the mirror, once a portal to the past, now a reflective surface that bore witness to the endurance of the human spirit. Story 20 The storm hit New Orleans with the ferocity of an enraged beast, the kind that residents, old and new, whispered about in the dimly lit corners of bars and around the dinner table with a mix of reverence and fear. It was said that every few decades a storm would come, not just to reclaim the land from the encroaching city, but to remind its inhabitants of the delicate balance between life and the afterlife, a balance that New Orleans danced upon with every note of jazz and every whispered voodoo curse. As the levees broke and the waters rose, swallowing streets and homes in their murky embrace, the city found itself battling not just the flood but the ghosts of its past. The cemetery, a historic site that had stood untouched by time, could not withstand the storm's wrath. Coffins, some centuries old, were unearthed by the deluge, their final resting places violated as they were carried into the heart of the city on the flood's relentless tide. The morning after the storm, the sun rose over a transformed New Orleans. The waters receded, leaving behind a city littered with the debris of both the present and the past. Among the wreckage, the coffins lay scattered, their occupants and possessions exposed to the light of day, a macabre reminder of the city's history with death. It was amidst this chaos that I found the diary, its leather cover worn but intact, protected from the water by a rusted metal box that had once been its coffin's secret compartment. The diary detailed the life of a woman whose name had been lost to history, a resident of New Orleans at the turn of the century. As I turned its pages, I was drawn into a tale of love, betrayal, and murder, a story that suggested the storm had indeed awakened more than just the spirits of the past. The diary spoke of a murder mystery that had gripped the city a hundred years ago, a tale of a prominent businessman found dead under mysterious circumstances. The police had ruled it an accident, but the diary told a different story. It hinted at dark secrets, of forbidden affairs and voodoo curses, and of a killer who had walked among the city's elite, his identity hidden behind a mask of respectability. Compelled by the diary's tale, I began to investigate the murder, retracing the steps of the woman who had penned the diary a century ago. The city itself seemed to guide me, its historic buildings and shadowed alleyways whispering secrets that had long been forgotten. 
As I delved deeper into the mystery, I realized that the storm had not just unearthed the physical remains of the past but had also stirred the echoes of old crimes, of vendettas that had lain dormant, waiting for a chance to resurface. The investigation led me to descendants of those involved in the century-old mystery, families who had lived in New Orleans for generations, each guarding their own piece of the city's history. They spoke of a curse that had been placed upon those responsible for the businessmen's death, a curse that had affected their families through the decades, bringing misfortune and tragedy. As the pieces of the puzzle came together, the identity of the murderer emerged, a revelation that threatened to shake the foundations of one of the city's oldest families. The diary, it seemed, had been more than just a recounting of events, it had been a confession, a final attempt by the author to make peace with her role in the dark saga that had unfolded. In the end, the storm had served as a catalyst, a force of nature that had cleared the way for old debts to be settled, for the truth to be revealed. New Orleans, ever resilient, began to recover from the flood, the city's rhythm slowly returning to its streets and homes. But for those who had been touched by the diary's tale, the city would never be the same. The storm had awakened the spirits of the past, but it had also brought closure, a chance for the city and its inhabitants to confront their history and move forward into the future. Story 21 It started as a challenge, an escape from the monotonous grind of daily life. The wilderness, with its uncharted territories and the promise of tranquility, seemed like the perfect antidote. My friends had backed out last minute, citing emergencies and unavoidable commitments, but the lure of adventure was too potent for me to resist. So there I was, heading into the embrace of the forest, alone but exhilarated. The first day was everything I had hoped for. The canopy above me danced in the breeze, filtering sunlight that played on the forest floor. Birds sang, and the air was fresh with the scent of pine and earth. I hiked deeper into the forest than I had planned, driven by a thirst for exploration, until the path became unfamiliar. Confidence, however, was my companion I had a map, a compass, and years of hiking experience. As dusk approached, I set up camp by a serene stream, its gurgling waters a comforting melody in the vast silence of the wilderness. That night, the first whispers of unease crept into my mind. The forest, alive with nocturnal sounds, felt different in the darkness. Each rustle, each snap, was amplified in the solitude, feeding a growing sense of vulnerability. I reminded myself that fear was simply a lack of understanding, a human reaction to the unknown. With that thought, I drifted into a restless sleep. The real nightmare, however, began the next morning. I awoke to a world shrouded in dense fog, visibility reduced to a mere few feet. My initial marvel at the ethereal beauty quickly soured as I realized the severity of my situation. The path, my only tether to civilization, had vanished beneath a blanket of white. Panic rose in my chest as I reached for my phone, only to find it dead. The battery, which I had sworn was full the night before, had somehow been drained. I tried to retrace my steps, relying on memory and instinct, but the forest had transformed. Landmarks seemed to shift, and trees once familiar now appeared as strangers, their twisted forms mocking my desperation. The fog, instead of lifting, grew thicker with every passing hour, and with it, the realization that I was lost, truly lost, in the unyielding wilderness. As the day wore on, my situation grew dire. The food and water I had packed, meant for a leisurely weekend hike, dwindled rapidly. Each rustling leaf and snapping twig no longer just echoed the horror of my isolation, they began to sound like whispers, as if the forest itself was alive, watching and waiting. The sun, obscured by the relentless fog, provided no sense of direction. Time became a blur, marked only by the slow, inevitable creep of despair. Night fell again, and with it, an oppressive darkness that seemed to weigh on my very soul. The cold seeped into my bones, 
and for the first time I felt the true terror of my predicament. I was alone, utterly alone, in a vast expanse of wilderness that was indifferent to my suffering. The sounds of the night were no longer just unsettling, they were terrifying. Every howl, every rustle, hinted at predators lurking just beyond sight, drawn by the scent of human vulnerability. In my darkest hour, I made a decision. If I was to survive, I could not succumb to fear. I gathered branches and leaves, hands trembling, and managed to start a fire. Its flickering light was a beacon in the darkness, a fragile shield against the unseen horrors of the night. Around that fire, I vowed to fight, to cling to life with every ounce of strength I possessed. As the flames danced, casting long shadows into the forest, I thought I saw movement. Shapes, indistinct and fluid, seemed to flit between the trees just beyond the fire's reach. My heart raced and I strained to see. But each time I looked, there was nothing. Was the forest playing tricks on me, or was there something out there watching, waiting? Emboldened by the flickering flames and the resolve hardening within me, I decided that I wouldn't let this wilderness conquer me. I spent the night close to the fire, its warmth a comfort against the encroaching cold and the unseen eyes I felt upon me. Despite the terror that clawed at the edges of my mind, exhaustion eventually claimed me, and I slipped into a fitful sleep, haunted by nightmares of being chased through an endless forest by shadows with gleaming eyes. When morning broke, the fog had lifted, revealing a landscape that felt altered, as if the forest had rearranged itself while I slept. With daylight on my side, I resolved to find a way out. I fashioned a makeshift compass, using my watch in the position of the sun, and chose a direction that felt intuitively right. I had no way of knowing for sure, but moving felt better than staying put, a prey waiting to be caught. The forest seemed endless, and with each step, hope wavered. My body ached with fatigue, my throat parched from thirst, and the minimal food I had left did little to stave off the gnawing hunger. But surrender was not an option. With each step, I told myself that survival was a testament to the human spirit's resilience, that I would not be another soul swallowed by the wilderness. As the sun began its descent, Marking another day lost in the vast, uncaring forest, I stumbled upon a clearing. It was an anomaly in the dense underbrush, a circle of grass that seemed almost cultivated in its perfection. At its center stood an old, gnarled tree, its branches stretching upwards like skeletal hands grasping at the sky. The sight of it sent shivers down my spine, an ominous feeling I couldn't shake. Compelled by a mix of curiosity and an inexplicable pull, I approached the tree. Carved into its ancient bark were symbols, not natural wear but deliberate marks, their meanings lost to time. As I traced them with my fingers, a sense of unease grew. The forest around me fell silent, as if holding its breath. Then, whispering voices filled the air, so faint I thought I had imagined them. They spoke in a language I didn't understand, yet the message was clear I was not welcome. The nightfall approached and with it, a decision. To stay in the clearing, with its eerie tree and the whispering voices, felt like courting danger. Yet venturing back into the forest meant facing the unknown horrors that lurked in the dark. With a heavy heart, I chose the latter, driven by an instinctual need to flee from the oppressive atmosphere of the clearing. I had not gone far when the real terror began. The whispers grew into howls and shadows detached from the darkness, circling me with malevolent intent. In a panic I ran, branches tearing at my skin, roots tripping me, as if the forest itself was determined to hinder my escape. Then, as suddenly as it had begun, the forest opened up, and I found myself on the edge of a road, the first sign of civilization in days, exhausted, injured, but alive, I collapsed, the adrenaline that had fueled my flight fading fast. The next thing I knew, headlights pierced the darkness, and a car screeched to a halt. People rushed to my aid, their voices a comforting sound after days of isolation. As I was whisked away to safety, I looked back at the forest one last time, a shiver running through me. 
Whatever resided within those trees, whatever forces had toyed with me, remained a mystery when I was fortunate to escape. Story 22 The feeling started as a whisper in the back of my mind, a niggling unease that I couldn't quite shake. It was the sensation of being observed, the prickling on the back of my neck when I walked home at night, the fleeting shadows that seemed to dart just out of sight. I told myself it was nothing, just the overactive imagination of someone who'd consumed too many thriller novels and crime podcasts. Yet the feeling persisted, growing stronger with each passing day. It became a game of noticing the unnoticeable. The same car parked a little too long across the street, the brief flash of a camera from a window, the two casual glances of strangers that lingered a fraction too long. I began to doubt my sanity, questioning whether the stress of daily life was manifesting in paranoia. Then came the notes. The first appeared innocuously enough, tucked into the edge of my mailbox, a piece of plain white paper, the words written in a neat, unassuming hand I liked the way you did your hair today. My initial reaction was confusion, followed swiftly by a cold dread. My hair, which I had tried a new style on a whim that morning, a detail so mundane I hadn't given it a second thought until that moment. With each subsequent note, the watcher detailed aspects of my routine with frightening precision. You look tired today. Rough night that coffee place you like was crowded this morning. You should wear that blue sweater more often. It suits you. Each message was a violation, an intrusion into my personal life by an unseen observer who moved through it with unsettling familiarity. The police were sympathetic but clear about the limitations of what they could do. Without a direct threat, their hands were tied. They advised caution, suggested changing routines, and offered to increase patrols in the neighborhood. But their words did little to alleviate the growing fear that clenched my heart. I changed my routes, varied my schedule, and became hyper-vigilant of my surroundings. Friends offered support, some even staying over on nights when the fear became too much to bear alone. Yet the notes continued to appear, each one a stark reminder that my efforts to evade my watcher were futile. It was a descent into a world where privacy no longer existed, where every action felt observed and every decision scrutinized. My home, once a sanctuary, now felt like a stage set up for the amusement of my stalker. The isolation was palpable, a barrier between me and the rest of the world that grew thicker with each passing day. The breaking point came one evening when I found a note inside my house. You're out of milk, the intrusion was undeniable. A clear message that there were no boundaries left to violate. The sanctuary I had clung to was breached, leaving me exposed and vulnerable. Panic took hold, a frantic energy that propelled me into action. I could no longer afford to be passive, to wait for a resolution that might never come. It was time to confront my watcher, to reclaim the life that had been steadily eroded by fear. With the help of a few close friends, I set a trap. We rigged cameras, planned for contingencies, and prepared to face whatever came next. The uncertainty was terrifying, but the need to end this nightmare outweighed the fear. The plan was simple bait the stalker into revealing themselves. I went about my routine exaggerated for effect while my friends monitored the cameras from a nearby location. The hours stretched on, each minute a test of our resolve. As night fell, the tension became almost unbearable. Then, a figure emerged from the shadows, cautious but purposeful, heading straight from my mailbox. The cameras captured every movement, every detail of the person who had haunted my days and nights for months. Confronting my stalker was a moment of surreal clarity. The fear, the paranoia, the violation of my privacy all crystallized into a single, intense focus. The person before me was no longer an abstract threat but a tangible reality, someone whose actions had a profound and damaging impact on my life. The confrontation was brief but cathartic. The police arrived swiftly, taking the stalker into custody. The relief was immediate, a physical weight lifting from my shoulders. Yet the aftermath was complex, 
a mixture of relief, anger, and lingering fear. Story 23 The evening began like any other, with the comforting routine of dinner and a movie before bed. My home, a modest two-story at the end of a quiet cul-de-sac, had always been my sanctuary, a place of peace and safety. Little did I know that the very notion of safety would be shattered before dawn. It was well past midnight when the unsettling noise of a window being pried open jolted me awake. Disoriented and heart racing, I lay in bed, straining my ears against the silence that followed, hoping I had imagined the sound. Then, unmistakably, the soft creak of the living room floorboards confirmed my worst fears someone was in my house. Panic set in, a visceral, paralyzing fear. My phone, my lifeline to the outside world, lay charging in the kitchen, impossibly out of reach. I was alone, vulnerable and without means to call for help. The only option available was to hide and hope for the intruders to leave. Moving with as much stealth as I could muster, I slid off the bed and pressed myself into the small space beneath it, my breath shallow, my heart a thunderous beat in the silence. From my vantage point I could see the door to my bedroom slightly ajar, a sliver of the hallway beyond illuminated by the moonlight streaming through the windows. The intruders moved through my home with a chilling familiarity, their footsteps and hushed voices a constant, unnerving presence. They spoke of valuables, of easy pickings, and the thrill of the theft. Their words, barely above whispers, carried a weight of malice that chilled me to the bone. Time stretched into eternity as I lay there, every creak and whisper amplifying my fear. The idea that they might find me, that the thin veil of my hiding spot could be torn away at any moment, was a terror I had never known. I prayed to anyone or anything that might be listening for the intruders to leave, to remain unaware of my presence. Then, footsteps approached my bedroom. The door creaked wider, and the beam of a flashlight swept across the room, coming dangerously close to my hiding place. I held my breath, willing myself to become invisible, a part of the shadows. The light lingered, probing as if the intruder sensed my presence. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it moved away, the footsteps receding. The relief was short-lived. The realization that I was not safe in my own home, that the sanctity of my personal space had been violated, was a violation more profound than the theft of any possession. I was a prisoner in my own home, my safety hanging by the thinnest of threads. As the intruders continued their search, I made a decision. I could not remain passive, a victim waiting for the worst to happen. With painstaking care, I edged my way out from under the bed and crawled towards the closet. There in the back, behind coats and boxes, was an old baseball bat. It was a small measure of defense, but it was something. Armed with the bat, I positioned myself behind the door, ready to defend myself if discovered. The wait was agonizing, a test of wills between my desire to remain hidden and the instinct to flee or fight. Then, as abruptly as it had begun, the night's terror came to an end. The intruders, having ransacked my home, made their escape, leaving behind a silence that was oppressive in its emptiness. I remained hidden until the first light of dawn crept through the windows, the shadows retreating before it. Emerging from my hiding place, I surveyed the damage. My home, once a place of comfort and security, was a tableau of disarray, a testament to the violation of my privacy and safety. The emotional toll was immediate and overwhelming. I was alive, but something fundamental had been taken from me a sense of safety that I feared I might never fully reclaim. The aftermath was a blur of police reports, insurance claims, and the sympathetic faces of friends and neighbors. The intruders were never caught, their identities a mystery that haunted me in the weeks and months that followed. I invested in security systems, changed locks, and took every precaution to ensure my safety, 
but the shadow of that night lingered. Story 24 Oom. The night of the accident is etched in my memory with the clarity of a photograph, each detail vivid against the backdrop of my life. It was late autumn, the air crisp and carrying the scent of decaying leaves. The road, familiar yet somehow foreign in the night's embrace, twisted through the countryside like a dark ribbon. We were returning from a concert, the euphoria of the night's music still pulsing through our veins. Laughter filled the car, a cocoon of joy oblivious to the world outside. I was in the back seat, lost in the warmth of friendship and the shared memories we were creating. It was a perfect moment, suspended in time, until the universe conspired to shatter it. The screech of tires tearing against asphalt pierced the night, a harbinger of the chaos to come. In that fraction of a second, instinct took over, a primal fear that clenched my heart and stole my breath. The world tilted, a surreal dance of lights and shadows as our car spun out of control. The collision was an orchestra of destruction metal bending, glass shattering, the world erupting into a cacophony of sounds that were too intense, too terrifying. Then, as quickly as it had begun, silence fell, a heavy, oppressive blanket that smothered the echoes of the crash. In the aftermath, trapped in the twisted wreckage of what had once been a car, I was alone with my consciousness. The others, my friends, were still, their laughter silenced, their stories ended in the blink of an eye. I called out, my voice a frail thing against the magnitude of what had happened, but there was no answer, only the whisper of the wind through broken windows. The wait for rescue was an eternity, each minute stretching into the next time losing meaning in the face of tragedy. When help finally arrived, cutting through the darkness with the blaze of sirens and lights, it was too late for them, but not for me. I was the sole survivor, a title as heavy as any crown, bestowed upon me by fate's indifferent hand. Hospital lights, sterile and too bright, were a stark contrast to the darkness of the crash site. Doctors spoke in hushed tones, words of comfort and condolences, but their voices were distant, muffled by the shock that enveloped me. I was alive, they said, a miracle given the devastation. But in those moments, and in the many that followed, survival felt less like a miracle and more like a sentence. The physical scars healed with time, stitches removed, bruises fading to pale echoes of the trauma. But the emotional wounds, the guilt and the grief were less visible and far more difficult to mend. Survivor's guilt became my shadow, a constant companion that whispered of what could have been of the lives cut short while mine continued. Counseling sessions, support groups, and endless conversations about healing and moving forward were all steps on a path I walked without direction. How do you reconcile the joy of being alive with the guilt of surviving when others did not? It was a question without an answer, a puzzle whose pieces didn't fit. The world moved on, as it always does, indifferent to the tragedies that unfold within it. I returned to a life that was both familiar and utterly changed, a reality where the absence of my friends was a palpable thing, a void that could not be filled. I found solace in solitude, in the silent company of my thoughts and memories. As the days turned to weeks, and the weeks to months, the sharp edges of grief dulled, worn down by the passage of time. The accident, though never forgotten, receded into the backdrop of my life, a defining moment that shaped but did not dictate my existence. I learned to live with the weight of that night, to carry it not as a burden, but as a reminder of the fragility of life and the strength of the human spirit. Continuing the journey from the depths of despair towards the light of understanding and acceptance is a path fraught with challenges and revelations. The narrative of survival weaves through the fabric of existence, touching upon the delicate threads of human resilience and the indomitable will to move forward. In the months that followed the accident, I found myself drawn to the places and activities that had once brought joy to my friends and me. 
Each visit was a pilgrimage, a way to honor their memories and reconnect with the essence of their lives. These moments were bittersweet, filled with the presence of absence, yet they also provided a solace, a bridge between the past and the present. The process of healing is not linear, nor is it predictable. There were days when the weight of survival seemed unbearable, moments when the randomness of fate seemed cruel and unforgiving. Yet there were also instances of profound clarity, when the beauty of life, in all its fragility, shone through the veil of sorrow. One such moment occurred on a cool autumn evening, much like the night of the accident. I found myself at a lookout point, a place where the city stretched out below like a tapestry of light and shadow. It was a spot we had all loved, a place of dreams and plans for the future. As I stood there, a sense of peace enveloped me, a feeling of being connected to something greater, a cosmic tapestry where loss and love intertwined. The realization that life is a mosaic of experiences, some joyful, some tragic, brought a new perspective. Each person's life, including those of my friends, is a story that continues beyond their physical presence in the world. They lived, they loved, they left an indelible mark on the hearts and souls of those who knew them. To carry their memory forward, to live fully and with purpose, was perhaps the most fitting tribute I could offer. Engaging with life after loss required a conscious effort, a daily decision to embrace the world in all its complexity. I sought out new experiences connecting with people in places that broadened my understanding of the human condition. Through these connections, I found threads of commonality, stories of loss and survival that mirrored my own. The shared experience of grief became a bridge, linking disparate souls in the universal quest for meaning. The path of healing led me to advocacy, to using my voice and my experience to support others navigating the aftermath of tragedy. In giving support, I found strength, a purpose that transcended personal loss and opened the door to collective healing. The journey was not without its setbacks, moments of doubt and despair, but each step forward was a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. As the story approaches its conclusion, the lessons of survival take on a deeper significance. The accident, a moment of devastating loss, became a catalyst for growth and understanding. The journey from survivor to advocate, from grief to acceptance, illustrates the transformative power of the human experience. Story 25 The first hint of trouble came with a whisper of wind, a gentle caress against the sails that spoke of a storm brewing on the horizon. By the time I realized the gravity of our situation, the sky had darkened and the sea had turned vicious, waves like monstrous hands trying to drag us down into the abyss. Our boat, a modest vessel meant for leisurely sails rather than battling tempests, was ill-equipped for such fury. The storm hit us with the wrath of the gods, tossing us about as if we were mere toys in a bathtub. I remember the panic, the shouting, the sound of wood splintering and then nothing but the roar of nature's fury and the cold embrace of the ocean. I awoke to the harsh kiss of the sun on my skin, lying on the bottom of a lifeboat. How I got there I couldn't recall. The ship, my friends, all signs of life had vanished, leaving me alone on this small craft adrift in an endless blue desert. My throat burned with thirst and my stomach ached with hunger, but it was the silence that was most deafening a quiet so profound it felt like a weight upon my chest. Days and nights began to blur into a single, endless cycle of suffering and despair. I kept count at first, etching marks into the wooden bench of the lifeboat, but as time passed, the will to keep track faded, replaced by a growing sense of hopelessness. The endless horizon became my prison, the sun my tormentor, beating down mercilessly, while the nights brought little relief, only the chilling embrace of solitude. I rationed the meager supplies found under the seats of the lifeboat a few bottles of water and packets of dried food, remnants of a safety kit perhaps not intended to sustain a soul for more than a few days. With each passing day, my rations dwindled, as did my hopes of rescue. Mirages taunted me, visions of ships on the horizon that vanished when I blinked, 
leaving behind a crushing disappointment. I began talking to myself, to the sea, even to a seagull that occasionally circled overhead, desperate for any semblance of connection in this vast emptiness. As the supplies ran out, I was forced to rely on rainwater collected in my makeshift tarpaulin and the occasional fish I managed to catch with my hands, their scales glittering like small, fleeting hopes in the palm of my hand. But it was the isolation, the endless solitude, that tested me the most. The human mind is not meant for such emptiness, for the absence of voices, of touch, of any sign that the world beyond this blue expanse continued to exist. It was on one of those endless days when the sun hung heavy in the sky that I saw it a smudge on the horizon, growing steadily larger. A ship, a real one, not born of the desperate fantasies that had haunted me. My heart raced as I waved my arms, screamed until my throat was raw, but the ship passed by, oblivious to my plight. The despair that followed was a physical thing, a weight that pressed me down until I could barely breathe. It was then that I realized I was not alone. Beneath the surface, something moved, a shadow in the depths, circling, watching. The sea, it seemed, was not content to be a passive witness to my suffering. Embracing the solitude, I began to see the ocean not as my enemy but as a relentless teacher, imparting lessons of resilience, patience, and surrender. The presence beneath the waves, whether real or conjured by my isolation, became a constant companion, a reminder of the unseen depths and mysteries lurking just beyond my perception. I spoke to it, shared my fears and hopes, and in its silent company, I found a strange kind of comfort. As days melded into weeks, my body weakened, but my spirit, paradoxically, grew stronger. I developed a routine, a daily ritual of survival that included scanning the horizon at dawn, fishing, collecting rainwater, and most importantly, preserving my mental health through meditation and reflection. The lifeboat, once a confining prison, became my sanctuary, a place of profound introspection and transformation. One morning, I awoke to an unfamiliar sound, a distant humming that pierced the usual silence. Scanning the horizon, I spotted a plane, a mere speck against the vast canvas of the sky. Energized by a surge of hope, I frantically waved the bright orange life jacket, my makeshift signal flag. The plane dipped its wings, a sign it had seen me, and circled back. Tears streamed down my face, not from despair, but from overwhelming relief and gratitude. Rescue, at last, seemed imminent. However, the sea had one final lesson for me. As I awaited my rescue, the shadow beneath the waves grew more agitated, circling closer to the surface. In a moment of clarity, I understood that this entity, whether a figment of my imagination or something more, had been my guardian, watching over me, ensuring my survival against all odds. When the rescue team finally arrived, hoisting me aboard a helicopter, I looked down at the lifeboat, a tiny speck adrift in the immense ocean. I whispered a goodbye to the sea and its mysteries, to the silent guardian who had kept me company in my darkest hours. The experience had changed me fundamentally, stripping away the superficialities of life and revealing the core of my being, forged in the crucible of survival. Back on land, the world seemed overwhelming, its noises deafening, its pace frenetic. Yet within me, there was an unshakable calm, a serenity born of my ordeal. I had faced my deepest fears, battled despair and loneliness, and emerged not just alive, but reborn. As I share this story, I do so not to recount a tale of survival against the odds, but to convey a deeper truth. We are all adrift in the vast sea of life, facing storms, battling our fears, and searching for meaning. My time lost at sea taught me the power of resilience, the importance of hope, and the unseen forces that guide and protect us, often in ways we cannot understand. The ocean, with its unfathomable depths and mysterious creatures, is a mirror reflecting the complexities of the human soul. My journey was a physical one, but the true voyage was inward, a journey to the heart of what it means to be alive, to be human. Story 26 For a moment of serendipity turned to horror, imagine me, an average person with a mundane job, getting trapped in an elevator. It was just another day, the clock hands inching past 6 p.m., signaling the end of another day's drudgery. The elevator, a box of metal and wires I had mindlessly stepped into countless times before, suddenly jerked and came to a grinding halt between the 10th and 11th floors. 
At first, it felt like a minor inconvenience, a brief pause in the day. But as minutes stretched into hours, the walls of the elevator began to feel closer, the air thicker. A dim emergency light flickered, casting long shadows that danced around me, fueling the growing sense of unease. The silence was oppressive, broken only by the occasional, distant echo of the building settling. Sounds that under normal circumstances would go unnoticed, now magnified into ominous whispers. Panic started to set in, a relentless wave crashing against my resolve. Thoughts raced through my mind, what if I'm never found? What if the cable snaps? Claustrophobia, a beast I didn't know lived within me, reared its ugly head, each shallow breath a battle. The phone in my pocket, which I hastily pulled out, showed no signal, a digital lifeline cut. I pressed the alarm button repeatedly, the sound harsh and echoing, yet no response came. It felt as though the world outside had forgotten me, leaving me suspended in a liminal space. The isolation was palpable, a thick, heavy blanket that wrapped around me, squeezing tighter with each passing hour. The darkness outside the elevator doors seemed to seep through the cracks, a physical entity intent on engulfing me. In this metal coffin, time lost all meaning, each second indistinguishable from the next. The dim emergency light became my sun and moon, dictating the cycle of hope and despair that ebbed and flowed within me. As the hours passed, my mind began to play tricks on me. Shadows morphed into figures, whispers turned into voices calling my name, each a manifestation of my deepest fears. I found myself speaking aloud, if only to hear a voice to remind myself I still existed. My words were desperate attempts at comfort, echoes in the steel chamber that returned to me twisted and foreign. The true horror wasn't the thought of dying in that elevator, but the realization of how fragile our connection to the world can be, how easily we can be erased from the minds and memories of those we hold dear. It was a lesson in insignificance, a glimpse into the abyss that waits silently for us all. Halfway through this ordeal, my mind teetered on the brink of sanity, the thin line between reality and imagination blurring. It was then, in the depths of despair, that I heard it a distant sound, not the product of my frazzled mind, but the clear, unmistakable noise of rescue. The story of my entrapment might not be filled with ghosts or ghouls, but the real horror was the battle within, the confrontation with my own vulnerabilities and fears. The experience left scars that were not visible, wounds that healed with time but left a mark on my soul. As the sound of rescue grew closer, a mix of relief and disbelief washed over me. The once oppressive silence was now punctured by the distant voices of my saviors, their words unclear but their intent unmistakable. The light at the end of the tunnel wasn't just a metaphor anymore, it was real, and it was inching closer. When the elevator doors finally creaked open, the flood of light from the hallway was blinding. The faces of the rescue team blurred into a single entity of salvation as they extended their hands to guide me out of my metallic prison. The transition from the dim, flickering light of the elevator to the bright, steady illumination of the building was jarring, a physical manifestation of the ordeal coming to an end. Stepping out of the elevator, my legs wobbled, betraying the strength I thought I had mustered. The building, once a familiar environment, now seemed alien, as if I was seeing it for the first time. Every sound was amplified, every movement scrutinized, as if my senses were trying to compensate for the hours spent in sensory deprivation. The aftermath of the incident was a blur of concerned faces, questions and medical checkups. Words of comfort and relief were offered, but they felt distant, unable to breach the barrier that the experience had erected around me. I was safe. Yes, but the feeling of isolation, of being cut off from the world, lingered like a shadow, a constant reminder of what had transpired. In the days that followed, the elevator became an object of fear, a symbol of my vulnerability. Stairs became my new path, not just a means to avoid the elevator, but as a way to reclaim some sense of control. Each step was a small victory, a defiance of the fear that sought to cripple me. The incident also sparked a newfound appreciation for the connections we often take for granted. Friends and family, once background characters in the busy screenplay of life, now took center stage. Conversations were deeper, interactions more meaningful. The fear of being forgotten, of disappearing without a trace, made me more present, 
more engaged with the world around me. As time passed, the sharp edges of the experience dulled, becoming another story to tell rather than a nightmare to relive. Yet, the lesson remained the real horror isn't always found in the supernatural or the grotesque, but in the realization of our own fragility, in the confrontation with our deepest fears. Story 27 It was supposed to be a routine surgery, something the doctors had described as a straightforward procedure. The hospital room was sterile and cold, a stark contrast to the warmth of the reassurances given by the medical staff. As the anesthesia was administered, I remember the anesthesiologist's voice, calm and professional, telling me to count backwards from ten. I barely made it past eight before slipping into darkness. Or so I thought. Instead of the void, I found myself in a state of heightened awareness, a cruel parody of consciousness. My eyes refused to open, my limbs wouldn't move. My voice was a prisoner within my own body. Yet, I could hear everything the mundane chatter of the surgical team, the beep of the heart monitor, the shuffle of feet. It was surreal, as if I was an observer, disconnected yet painfully present. Then, the surgery began. The first incision was a shock wave of pain, a sensation so intense and raw that my mind struggled to process it. It was beyond anything I had ever experienced or could have imagined. The term pain felt inadequate, a word too simple to describe the violation of being cut open while fully conscious. I wanted to scream, to beg them to stop, but my body was a traitor unresponsive to my desperate commands. With each slice, each manipulation of my flesh, the agony multiplied. It was a symphony of torment, each new movement a crescendo that threatened to overwhelm my senses. I tried to retreat into my mind, to find some refuge in memories or fantasies, but the pain was a relentless pursuer, leaving no corner of my consciousness untouched. The sense of helplessness was complete. Trapped within my own body, I was a prisoner to the pain, to the casual conversations of the surgeons unaware of the horror unfolding in the silence of my mind. I heard them talk about weekend plans, about mundane matters of life, a grotesque juxtaposition to the nightmare I was living through. As the surgery progressed, time lost all meaning. Each second was an eternity of suffering, a relentless assault on my psyche. I was adrift in a sea of pain, with no land in sight, each wave crashing over me with unforgiving force. The concept of after seemed like a fantasy, a fairy tale told to soothe a child, but one I clung to with desperate hope. And then, as suddenly as it had begun, it was over. The voices around me changed, signaling the end of the procedure. The relief I expected did not come the pain lingered a ghostly reminder of what I had endured. When the paralysis finally began to fade, when I could finally blink move a finger, it felt like emerging from a tomb, a resurrection born of pain. The aftermath was a blur of faces, of questions I couldn't answer, emotions I couldn't express. The physical scars would heal, the doctors assured me, but the mental ones were a different story. How do you explain a trauma that leaves no visible mark? How do you convince others of a horror they can't see or understand? In the weeks and months that followed, sleep was elusive, a once welcoming respite now a battlefield. Each time I closed my eyes, I was back on that operating table, feeling every incision, every touch. The line between awake and asleep, between reality and memory, blurred. The experience left me with a profound sense of vulnerability, a constant reminder of the fragility of our control over our own bodies. It was a lesson in the depths of human endurance, in the strength required to rebuild oneself from the ashes of such an ordeal. The road to recovery was not just physical, but profoundly psychological. Each day presented a new challenge, a battle between the desire to move forward and the weight of the trauma that clung to me like a second skin. My relationship with my body had fundamentally changed. It felt like an entity separate from me, a vessel that had betrayed me at the most crucial moment. 
Support groups became a lifeline, spaces where words like anesthesia awareness were not met with disbelief, but with nods of understanding. Here I found solace in the shared experiences, the collective acknowledgement of our nightmares. Listening to others, I realized the importance of giving voice to our pain, of transforming our silence into a chorus of resilience. Yet, even surrounded by those who understood, a sense of isolation lingered. The world outside our meetings seemed oblivious to the depth of our scars. Friends and family, though well-meaning, struggled to grasp the magnitude of the trauma. But you're okay now, right, they would ask, their questions a chasm between my reality and their perception. The journey through therapy was arduous, a path that required me to confront the memories I wished to forget. Each session was a step towards reclaiming my body, towards mending the rift between my physical self and my psyche. The process was painstaking, a delicate dance between healing and reliving, but it was necessary. Through it, I learned the power of narrative, of reshaping the story of my trauma into one of survival. I also delved into research, seeking to understand the phenomenon that had shattered my life. Knowledge became another form of control, a way to demystify the experience that had once seemed like a cruel twist of fate. I learned about the rare but real instances of anesthesia awareness, about the mechanisms that failed in my case. This pursuit of understanding was not just about finding answers, but about forging a shield against the helplessness that had once consumed me. In time, I found ways to cope with the triggers, the unexpected reminders of that day. The sound of a heart monitor on television, the sight of a hospital gown, no longer sent me spiraling. I developed strategies, mental fortresses to protect against the flashbacks, and gradually the edges of my trauma softened. Advocacy became a new purpose, a way to channel the ordeal into positive action. By raising awareness about anesthesia awareness, by pushing for enhanced protocols in patient education, I hope to spare others from a similar fate. Each presentation, each article, felt like a step towards a future where such nightmares were even rarer. Healing, I realized, was not a return to the person I was before the surgery, but the evolution into someone new. This new version of me was scarred, yes, but also stronger, more compassionate, and more resilient. The pain, both physical and emotional, had sculpted a depth of character and a capacity for empathy I had not known possible. As I share this story, I do so not from a place of unresolved trauma, but from a standpoint of empowerment. It is a testament to the human spirit's ability to endure, to find meaning in suffering, and to emerge from the depths of despair with a renewed sense of purpose. Story 28 In the digital age, identity is more than just a name or a face, it's a mosaic of data points, each a thread in the fabric of our lives. I learned this the hard way when my identity was stolen, a violation so profound it felt like a part of my soul had been ripped away. This is not just a story of theft, it's a tale of loss, betrayal, and the struggle to reclaim what was mine. It started innocently enough, with a few odd emails and phone calls, discrepancies I brushed off as clerical errors. But the reality was far more sinister. Someone, somewhere, had hijacked my identity, and with it, they began to dismantle my life piece by piece. Bank accounts emptied, credit cards maxed out, loans taken out in my name, each discovery was a blow, a reminder of my vulnerability. The realization that someone was masquerading as me was surreal. To the world, they were me, spending my money, tarnishing my reputation. The financial loss was devastating, but it was the personal violation that cut deeper. My name, my history, every piece of me that existed in the digital ether was compromised. I was left to question every aspect of my identity, to wonder what it meant to be me when someone else could so easily assume my life. The battle to reclaim my identity was a labyrinth of bureaucracy, a seemingly endless cycle of phone calls, emails, and paperwork. Each step forward was met with resistance, a system designed to protect that instead felt like it was working against me. The irony was bitter in trying to prove I was myself, 
I felt more lost than ever. As the financial toll mounted, so did the emotional strain. Relationships were strained, the suspicion that it was someone I knew a seed of paranoia that grew unchecked. Friends and family, though supportive, couldn't fully grasp the magnitude of the betrayal. I was adrift in a sea of uncertainty, each day a struggle to stay afloat. The thief's actions were like ripples in a pond, affecting not just my financial stability but my place in the world. Job opportunities vanished, my credit score a scarlet letter that closed doors I had taken for granted. The future I had envisioned for myself was replaced by a question mark, each possibility tainted by the shadow of this violation. But in this darkest of times a resilience within me stirred. Refusing to be defined by the actions of another, I began to fight back. With each piece of documentation, each report filed, I reclaimed a part of myself. The process was painfully slow, a test of patience and perseverance, but with each victory, no matter how small, I found strength. This journey was not one I walked alone. Support groups, both online and in person, became havens of understanding and empathy. Here I found others who had traversed the same dark path, their stories different but their pain familiar. In sharing my own story, I found solace, a sense of community that was a balm to the loneliness that had enveloped me. The legal battles were daunting, each court appearance a confrontation with the faceless entity that had turned my life upside down. But with each ruling in my favor, the weight of the ordeal began to lift. Piece by piece, I started to rebuild, each step forward a declaration of my resilience. Recovery was not just about the financial aspect, but about restoring my faith in myself and in the world around me. I became an advocate for cybersecurity, my ordeal a cautionary tale that I hoped would spare others my fate. Education became my weapon, my experience is a tool to help others navigate the treacherous waters of the digital age. As I stand now, looking back on the nightmare that unfolded, I see not just the pain and the betrayal, but the incredible journey of recovery. The person who emerged from this ordeal is stronger, wiser, and more resilient. My identity once stolen is now my own again, each facet a testament to the fight to reclaim it. The scars remain, reminders of the vulnerability we all share in this interconnected world. But they also remind me of the strength we possess, the capacity to overcome and to emerge from the darkness into the light. As the ordeal unfolded, transforming from a personal crisis into a legal battle, the depths of the cyber thief's invasion became painfully clear. The person behind the screen had woven themselves into the fabric of my life with terrifying precision, exploiting the trust I had placed in the digital guardians of my identity. It was a stark reminder of the fragility of our online selves, how quickly everything we've built can be dismantled by those who lurk in the shadows of cyberspace. The path to justice was fraught with challenges, each step revealing the inadequacies of a system ill-equipped to deal with the complexities of digital crime. My identity thief was not just a single adversary, but part of a larger, more insidious network that preyed on the unsuspecting. Unraveling this web of deceit required more than just determination, it required delving into the murky world of cybercrime, understanding its nuances, and outsmarting those who hid behind the anonymity of the internet. With the help of cybersecurity experts, I began to piece together the digital breadcrumbs left behind by the thief. Each clue was a step closer to reclaiming my life, but also a dive deeper into the rabbit hole of online vulnerability. I learned about the dark web, about the marketplaces where identities were traded like commodities, and about the sophisticated tactics used to evade detection. The fight for justice was a double-edged sword. With each victory, each piece of reclaimed identity, came the realization of how widespread and deeply rooted the problem of identity theft was. It was a war not just against my thief but against a pervasive threat that affected millions. This realization sparked a transformation within me, from victim to advocate. My story, once a source of pain and shame, became a powerful tool in the fight against cybercrime. 
I started a blog, sharing my journey from the depths of despair to the steps of the courthouse. Each post, each piece of advice, was a beacon for others navigating the aftermath of identity theft. The response was overwhelming, a flood of stories that mirrored my own, each a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. The blog evolved into a community, a coalition of victims turned warriors, each armed with the knowledge and the determination to make a difference. We pushed for stronger cybersecurity laws, for greater transparency from financial institutions, and for more resources for victims. Our voices, once silenced by fear and confusion, were now a chorus demanding change. As the legal proceedings drew to a close, with the thief finally facing the consequences of their actions, a sense of closure began to settle over me. It wasn't just the satisfaction of seeing justice served, it was the knowledge that my ordeal had sparked a movement, that my story was a catalyst for change. Looking back, the journey from victim to advocate was not one I would have chosen, but it was one that chose me. The cyber nightmare that had threatened to destroy me had instead forged a new path, one where I could stand tall, not just as a survivor but as a beacon of hope for others. The scars of the experience remain, a reminder of the ordeal, but they also serve as a badge of honor, a symbol of the battle fought and won. My identity, once stolen, is now unequivocally mine, each facet a reflection of the journey I've undertaken, a testament to the power of resilience in the face of adversity. Story 29 the sun had set on what was an ordinary day, the kind where you don't expect anything out of the norm to happen. But normalcy is a fragile veneer, easily shattered by the unexpected. That evening, my world was turned upside down, throwing me into a reality I never could have imagined a reality where I was no longer free. I was walking home, the same route I'd taken countless times before, lost in thought about the mundane details of my day. Suddenly, a van pulled up beside me, and before I could react, I was roughly pulled inside. The world outside the van's tinted windows blurred into obscurity as we sped away. My attempts to fight, to scream, were quickly stifled by hands stronger than my own. A blindfold obscured my vision, casting me into darkness, while binding secured my wrists, leaving me powerless. The drive felt endless, time stretching and contorting as fear took hold. When the van finally came to a stop and I was let out, my senses struggled to fill in the blanks left by my blinded eyes. The air was cooler, the ground beneath my feet uneven. Then silence, save for the sound of a door creaking open and the echo of my captor's footsteps as I was led into my prison. The room where I was held captive was devoid of light, a void where time seemed to stand still. My blindfold was removed but it made no difference in the pitch black darkness. The air was stale, heavy with the weight of despair. I could feel the presence of walls close and confining, a tangible reminder of my captivity. The silence was oppressive, broken only by the distant, indiscernible sounds of the outside world, a world that felt increasingly remote. Days passed, or at least I assumed they did. In the absence of light, my internal clock unraveled, leaving me disoriented. Hunger and thirst became constant companions, each passing hour a test of endurance. But it was the not knowing that gnawed at me the most the identity of my captors, the reason for my abduction, the likelihood of my release. The fear of the unknown was a relentless tormentor, an ever-present shadow that whispered doubts and fueled my despair. Despite the darkness, I clung to hope a fragile thread in the overwhelming gloom. I listened intently for any sound that might signal rescue the approach of footsteps, the turn of a key, a voice calling my name. These sounds never came, but my hope persisted, a defiance against the despair that sought to consume me. Escape became an obsession, a focus for my wandering thoughts. I tested the limits of my bindings, the strength of the door that kept me imprisoned, each attempt was met with failure, but with failure came determination, a resolve to keep trying, 
to keep fighting for a freedom that seemed increasingly elusive. In the silence and the darkness, my mind became my sanctuary and my tormentor. Memories of my life before captivity played in an endless loop, each one a reminder of what I had lost, of what I was fighting to regain. I planned escapes, imagined rescues, clung to fantasies that kept the terror at bay. Fear and hope waged a constant battle within me, the outcome uncertain. And then when despair seemed to have the upper hand, there was a change. The sound of a key turning in a lock, the creak of the door as it opened, the rush of fresh air as it filled the room. Light, blinding and pure, invaded the darkness, a herald of change. Figures stood in the doorway, silhouetted against the light, their identities obscured. The end of my captivity was not a moment of triumph but of confusion and relief, a jumble of emotions too complex to unravel. The reasons for my abduction remained a mystery, the identity of my captors a puzzle left unsolved. But in that moment, none of it mattered. I was free, pulled from the darkness into the light, my ordeal a nightmare from which I had finally awoken. The aftermath of my abduction was a journey of healing, of grappling with the shadows that lingered. But within that journey was a story of resilience, of the indomitable spirit that refuses to be extinguished, even in the darkest of times. As I stumbled out of the dark room, the intensity of the light overwhelmed me, forcing my eyes shut after days of unyielding darkness. The hands that guided me out were gentle, a stark contrast to the ones that had violently torn me from my life. Voices surrounded me, soft and reassuring, yet they were as foreign to my ears as the sensation of fresh air on my skin. My rescue was not the end of the ordeal, but the beginning of a new chapter marked by recovery and adjustment. The physical scars were few, but the mental ones etched deep grooves into my psyche. Nightmares haunted my sleep, each one a vivid reliving of my abduction and captivity. The world outside, once familiar and comforting, now seemed fraught with unseen dangers, every stranger a potential threat. The question of why hung over me like a specter. Why had I been taken? What had been the purpose? No answers were forthcoming, the motives of my captors as enigmatic as their identities. The lack of closure was a wound that refused to heal, leaving me to wrestle with the ambiguity of my experience. In the aftermath, the notion of safety became elusive. My home, once a sanctuary, now felt like a fortress that needed constant guarding. Relationships were strained under the weight of my trauma friends and family, despite their best intentions, could not fully penetrate the barrier my experience had erected around me. Yet, within this male anchoia of fear and uncertainty, a spark of resilience flickered. I began to seek solace in therapy, a space where my fears and anxieties could be unpacked and examined under the light of professional guidance. Each session was a step toward reclaiming the pieces of myself that had been lost in the darkness of that room. Support groups became a lifeline, connecting me with others who had walked similar paths. There was comfort in shared experience, and the understanding that flowed from those who had navigated their own journeys back from the brink. Together, we formed a tapestry of survival, each story a thread that strengthened the whole. As time passed, the sharp edges of my memories dulled, softened by the passage of days and the efforts to rebuild. The act of living became a form of defiance, each mundane activity a declaration of my ongoing recovery. I found joy in small victories, in moments of normalcy that at once seemed forever out of reach. Story 30 The lab was quiet, the kind of silence that amplifies the smallest sounds the hum of the refrigerator storing samples, the occasional beep of equipment running late night diagnostics. It was a familiar environment, one that spoke of research, discovery, and the quest for knowledge. But that night, the quest took a turn toward the unknown, transforming the sanctuary of science into a cell of my own making. Working late had become a habit, driven by the urgency of our research. The project was ambitious, a potential breakthrough in the treatment of a virus that had eluded the medical community for years. 
Each experiment, each test, brought us closer to understanding, to a solution that could save countless lives. It was this potential that fueled my dedication, that kept me in the lab long after my colleagues had gone home. The mistake happened in a moment of distraction, a lapse in the rigorous protocols that were second nature. A vial slipped from my fingers, shattering on the floor, its contents a deadly mist that I inhaled before I could stop myself. The realization of what had happened was immediate, a cold wave of dread that washed over me as I initiated the emergency quarantine procedures. Alone in the quarantine room, the weight of my mistake pressed down on me. The irony was cruel I had become a host to the very virus we sought to conquer. The protocols for such an exposure were clear, and I followed them to the letter, documenting the accident, notifying my superiors, and beginning the process of observation and documentation that would define the days to come. As the hours turned into days, the virus took hold. My body became a battleground, a war of attrition between the virus and my immune system. The symptoms started subtly fatigue, a mild fever, the kind of signs that could easily be dismissed. But I knew what was coming, and I documented each new symptom with clinical detachment, a scientist to the end. The quarantine room became my world, a sterile environment that was both my prison and my sanctuary. Equipment monitored my vital signs, recording data that I hoped would one day contribute to finding a cure. Video messages to my colleagues, my family, became my only means of communication, each one potentially my last. The isolation was profound, a solitude that went beyond the physical separation from the world. There was a mental and emotional distance, a barrier between me and those I loved, forged by the knowledge of what I faced. I clung to hope not for my own survival, but for the possibility that my ordeal would serve a greater purpose. As the infection progressed, my condition deteriorated. Each entry in my journal, each recorded message became more difficult. Yet, I persisted, driven by the need to leave behind something of value, a beacon for those who would continue the fight after I was gone. In the depths of illness, my mind wandered. I thought of the choices that had led me to this moment, of the passion for science that had defined my life. Regrets were a luxury I could not afford instead. I focused on the hope that my data, my experience, would contribute to a future where such mistakes were nothing more than a footnote in the history of a conquered disease. My story is not one of heroism, but of a simple mistake with profound consequences. It's a cautionary tale of the risks inherent in our quest for knowledge, of the thin line between discovery and disaster. Yet, it's also a testament to the human spirit, to the drive to contribute to the greater good, even in the face of personal tragedy. As I document these final stages, the world beyond the quarantine room feels both close and infinitely distant. I am a scientist, a researcher, a victim of my own error, but above all, I am human, a single thread in the larger tapestry of our collective struggle against the unseen forces that threaten us. In the waning moments of clarity, as the virus ravaged my body and mind, I found a strange peace amidst the turmoil. It was as if in facing the end, the petty concerns that once occupied my thoughts had fallen away, leaving only the essence of what truly mattered. My life's work, my relationships, the quest for knowledge, all condensed into the purest form of understanding and acceptance. The data I collected, meticulously recorded even as my hands trembled and my vision blurred, became my legacy. Each entry, a snapshot of the battle being waged within me, was a piece of the puzzle for those who would continue the fight. I took solace in the knowledge that, in some small way, my experience would contribute to the greater understanding of the virus, perhaps leading to a breakthrough that would save others from my fate. I thought of my colleagues, brilliant minds united in a common purpose, who would analyze this data, extract insights, and forge ahead. The thought of them, continuing the work we had started together, provided a comfort that the sterile walls of the quarantine room could not. I was leaving behind a torch that others would carry, a flame of discovery that would not be extinguished. 
As my physical strength waned, my resolve strengthened. The act of documenting, of contributing to the scientific body of knowledge, became a meditation, a final testament to the dedication that had defined my career. Each symptom, each progression of the virus, was recorded with a precision that belied the chaos unfolding within me. The moments of despair, though they came, were fleeting. I had accepted my fate, but not as a victim. Instead, I embraced the role of observer, a scientist to the very end, witnessing the culmination of a life dedicated to understanding the mysteries of the natural world. The support of my family, conveyed through messages and calls, was a balm for the soul. They understood the importance of my work, the need to continue despite the personal cost. Their love and pride, undiminished by the circumstances, were pillars of strength that sustained me. In those final days, the boundaries between life and work, personal and professional, blurred into irrelevance. My quarantine, my isolation, was not just a physical barrier but a symbolic one, separating the world of the living from the realm of data and discovery. Yet even in isolation, I never felt truly alone. The connection to my colleagues, to the scientific community, and to humanity itself was a constant presence. A reminder of the indelible mark each of us leaves on the world. When the end came, it was with a quiet dignity. The machines that had monitored my decline fell silent. The data collected one last contribution to the fight against the virus. My final thoughts were not of fear or regret, but of hope, a hope that my experience, my sacrifice, would serve as a beacon for future generations, guiding them toward a cure toward a victory over the invisible enemy that had claimed my life. Story 34 In the depths of a soundproof basement, the concept of time disintegrated into a meaningless haze. The space was stark, illuminated by the harsh light of a single bulb that never dimmed, turning shadows into my constant companions. This was my world now, a prison meticulously designed by a serial kidnapper whose face I had seen only once, but whose presence haunted every moment. The air was thick with despair, heavy with the knowledge of those who had been here before me and had not left. The first days, or perhaps they were weeks, were a blur of confusion and fear. My mind raced with questions that had no answers. Why me? What did he want? How could I possibly escape? The realization that I was trapped in a soundproof room was a blow that sank me into depths of despair I had never known. Screams for help were swallowed by the suffocating silence, a grim reminder of my isolation. But as the initial shock wore off, a fierce determination took root. I refused to become another nameless victim, forgotten in the darkness. I began to study my prison with a critical eye, searching for any weakness any oversight in its construction that I could exploit. The door was solid, reinforced, with no visible locks to pick, a barrier that seemed insurmountable. Yet, it was in the smallest details that I found a glimmer of hope. The air vent high up on the wall, overlooked in its mundanity, became the focus of my attention. It was narrow, but desperation lent me ingenuity. I started to dismantle my bed, using the metal frame to fashion tools, pieces of wire to probe and explore the screws that held the grate in place. Each night, as I worked by the dim light, the sound of my heart pounding in my chest was the only indication of time passing. The fear of discovery loomed large, a specter that threatened to paralyze me. But the thought of freedom, of escaping the clutches of a monster, drove me forward. My fingers bled, my muscles ached, but with each passing night, the vent began to yield, the screws loosening under my persistent efforts. Food and water were delivered through a slot in the door, my only contact with the outside world. I began to hoard the plastic utensils, anything that could be repurposed into a tool, a weapon. I mapped out the layout of the basement in my mind, rehearsing the steps I would take once I got through the vent, the paths I could take to evade capture. The day finally came when the vent was open enough to squeeze through. 
My body was weak from malnutrition, but adrenaline surged through my veins, a potent cocktail of fear and hope. I pushed myself through the narrow opening, scraping against metal edges, fighting against the claustrophobic grip of the duct. The crawl was torturous, a physical and mental ordeal that tested the limits of my endurance. But when I emerged, covered in dust and sweat, into the dimly lit corridors of the house above, a rush of exhilaration swept through me. I was out of the basement, but not yet free. The house was silent, a maze of shadows and danger. I moved with caution, avoiding creaking floorboards, pausing at every sound. The knowledge that the kidnapper could return at any moment was a constant thrum of anxiety that propelled me forward. My escape was a gamble, each step a roll of the dice. When I finally reached the back door, my hands trembling as I turned the lock, the night air hit me with the force of a revelation. I was free, but freedom was not without its costs. The world I stepped back into was not the one I had left behind. The ordeal had changed me, marked me in ways visible and invisible. The police were called, statements taken, but the man who had taken me remained a shadow, a question mark that loomed over my recovery. My story was one of survival, of a fight clawed from the depths of despair. But it was also a reminder of the darkness that exists in the world, a darkness I had stared into and overcome. Story 35 As the last of the daylight bled away, replaced by an ominous reddish hue that painted the sky, I knew I was in for a night unlike any other. The wildfires that had been a distant, somewhat abstract threat had crept closer with a veracity that defied belief, encircling my home with a barrier of flames and smoke. The air, thick with the scent of burning pine and ash, made every breath a battle. It was as though the very atmosphere sought to suffocate me, to claim me as another victim of the relentless inferno. The power had gone out hours ago leaving me with nothing but the flickering light of candles and the haunting glow of the fire outside to combat the encroaching darkness. My phone, now a precious lifeline to the outside world, lay in my hand, its battery symbol flashing ominously. I had already sent countless messages, made numerous calls, all in a desperate bid for rescue. But as the night drew on, the responses became fewer and further between until they stopped altogether. Alone, I tried to fortify my spirits with memories of better days, times when the land around my home was alive with the lush green of trees and the vibrant colors of wildflowers, not the charred, desolate landscape it had become. The sound of the fire was a constant companion, a roaring in the distance that grew ever louder, ever closer. It was the sound of my impending doom. I had prepared as best as I could, following every guideline for wildfire safety. The house was sealed, the area around it cleared of anything that could fuel the flames further. Yet, as I watched the fire advance, I couldn't help but feel how futile my efforts were against the sheer force of nature. The realization that my home, my sanctuary, might soon be reduced to ashes was a weight on my soul. In a moment of desperation, I ventured to the roof, hoping to catch sight of any sign of rescue through the smog. The ladder groaned under my weight, a stark reminder of the fragility of everything I had taken for granted. The view from the top was a vision of hell. Flames danced across the horizon, their heat so intense I could feel it even from my vantage point. The sky, a canvas of reds and oranges, seemed to mock my plight. Just as I was about to retreat back into the relative safety of my home, a flicker of movement caught my eye. Through the haze, I could make out the outline of a figure, moving with purpose through the chaos. Hope surged within me, only to be dashed as the figure disappeared from view, swallowed by the smoke. Was it a rescuer, come at last, or merely a trick of the light, a phantom born of my desperate mind? I climbed down, my heart heavy, my mind racing with fear and uncertainty. The night stretched on, each minute an eternity as I awaited a fate that seemed all but sealed. And then, amid the despair, a sound that was not the fire nor the wind. 
a knock at the door faint but unmistakable. With bated breath, I approached the door, the knock echoing like a beacon of hope in the depths of my despair. The very idea of someone being out there, someone coming to my aid in this inferno, seemed too good to be true. Yet the knocking persisted, urgent and insistent. I unlatched the door, bracing myself for what or who I might find on the other side. Through the smoke, a figure materialized, clad in the unmistakable gear of a firefighter. His mask obscured his face, but his eyes spoke volumes, conveying a mix of determination and concern. We need to move, now he said, his voice muffled but clear. I was stunned, relief flooding through me, followed swiftly by adrenaline. The rescue I had deemed increasingly unlikely had arrived in the eleventh hour. He led me away from the house, toward the safety of a waiting vehicle. Glancing back, I saw my home for what I feared would be the last time, its familiar contours outlined against the fiery backdrop. The firefighter guided me through the smoke and debris with a firm hand, his presence a calming force in the midst of chaos. As we drove away, the scale of the wildfire became apparent. What had once been a picturesque landscape was now a war zone, nature's fury unleashed. The firefighter told me stories of the front lines, of homes saved and lost, of the relentless battle against the advancing flames. His voice, though tinged with fatigue, carried a note of unwavering resolve. It was a reminder that even in the face of overwhelming adversity, there were those who stood ready to confront it head on. The journey to safety was a blur, the scenes outside the window merging into a nightmarish tableau. Yet, within the confines of the vehicle, there was a semblance of safety, a temporary reprieve from the hell outside. The firefighter's presence was a constant reassurance, a beacon of humanity in the darkness. Finally, we reached the evacuation center, a hive of activity and refuge for those displaced by the fire. The air here was clearer, the sky less menacing, but the sense of loss was palpable. Families huddled together, faces etched with fear and exhaustion, their stories written in the ash that coated their clothes and skin. As I stepped into the center, the reality of my situation sank in. I was safe, but at what cost? My home, my memories, were they now just embers in the wind? Yet, amidst the grief, there was a spark of something else gratitude. Gratitude for the bravery of those like the firefighter who had risked everything to guide me to safety, for the resilience of a community banding together in the face of disaster. Story 36 The boundless sea stretched out before me, a vast expanse of undulating waves beneath the starlit sky. Embarking on a solo voyage across the Atlantic had been a dream of mine, a test of endurance, skill, and will against the might of the ocean. For weeks, I had sailed under the sun and stars, the wind and waves my constant companions, but nothing could have prepared me for the terror that awaited me in the heart of the night. It was a night like any other, with the gentle rocking of the boat lulling me into a sense of complacency. The breeze was favorable, the sky clear, and the sea seemingly at peace with my intrusion upon its domain. Then, without warning, the world turned upside down. A rogue wave, a monstrous wall of water emerging from the darkness, struck with the fury of Poseidon himself. In an instant, my boat capsized, tossing me into the cold, unforgiving embrace of the Atlantic. The shock of the cold water was like a thousand needles piercing my skin, stealing my breath away. Panic set in as I struggled to surface, the weight of my soaked clothes pulling me down into the depths. When I finally broke through to the air, Gasping for breath, the sight that greeted me was one of utter despair. My boat, my only lifeline, was adrift, overturned, and slowly being claimed by the sea. Clutching at the debris, I fought to stay afloat, my mind racing with the grim realization of my predicament. The vast ocean around me offered no comfort, no hope, only the endless dark waters that could become my grave. The isolation was complete a solitary human speck in the midst of an indifferent sea. The hours passed, or so it seemed, 
each moment stretching into an eternity of fear and uncertainty. The night air was cold, biting at my flesh, sapping my strength. Hypothermia began to whisper its deadly promises, urging me to surrender, to let the sea take me. But I refused to give in, clinging desperately to the hope of rescue, to the thought of seeing loved ones again, of feeling the solid earth beneath my feet. As dawn broke, the first light of day brought no solace, only the stark reality of my situation. The sea stretched out in all directions, a horizon unbroken by any sign of salvation. I was alone, adrift, at the mercy of the sea. My thoughts turned inward, reflections on a life lived and the choices that had led me to this moment. Regrets, joys, and unfulfilled dreams mingled with the fight for survival a battle waged against both the elements and the despair within. Then, in my darkest hour, as the sun climbed higher in the sky, a shadow appeared on the horizon. At first, it seemed nothing more than a trick of the light, a mirage born of desperation. But as it drew closer, the outline of a ship took form, a vessel cutting through the waves, a beacon of hope in the vast emptiness. Renewed with a fragile thread of hope, I mustered every ounce of strength left in my body, waving my arms, shouting with a voice hoarse from salt and wind, desperate to catch their attention. Time slowed to a crawl as the ship drew nearer, its form becoming clearer with each passing moment, until finally it was undeniable. They had seen me. The rescue operation was swift a testament to the crew's efficiency and the mercy of the sea that had decided to spare me. A small rescue boat was lowered into the water, its engine cutting through the waves as it made its way toward me. Hands reached out, pulling me from the cold grasp of the ocean, wrapping me in blankets, and offering me sips of warm liquid that sparked life back into my shivering body. As the ship carried me away from the site of my ordeal, I watched the ocean's expanse, a mix of fear and awe still gripping my heart. The sea, with its unmatched power and indifference, had reminded me of my insignificance in the face of nature's vastness. Yet within that same immensity, I had found a will to survive, a determination to cling to life against all odds. The journey to safety was long, giving me hours to reflect on the experience that had brought me to the brink and back. My rescuers, a crew aboard a cargo ship making its routine crossing, became my temporary companions. They shared their stories of the sea, tales of beauty and danger, of storms weathered and calm seas cherished. In their camaraderie I found a semblance of peace, a sense of belonging to a community that understood the call of the ocean. Upon reaching land, the solid ground beneath my feet felt strange, almost foreign, after the ordeal at sea. The world seemed different, or perhaps I was the one who had changed. The experience had left its mark, a reminder of the fragility of life and the strength required to face the unknown. In the days and weeks that followed, my story became one of many, a testament to the unpredictability of the sea and the resilience of the human spirit. I had faced my deepest fears, battled against the odds, and emerged with a newfound appreciation for the preciousness of each moment. The sea, once a realm of adventure and freedom, now held a deeper meaning for me. It was a place of profound power and mystery, capable of both destruction and renewal. My journey across the Atlantic had not ended as I had planned, but it had given me something far more valuable, a deeper understanding of myself and the world around me. Story 37 Imagine the cold, chilling air of a late night in a bustling city, where the streets are mostly deserted, leaving only the whispers of the wind and the occasional distant siren to break the silence. In one such desolate alley, a figure, cloaked in the anonymity of darkness, witnessed a crime so vile it seemed ripped from the pages of a thriller novel. This person, whom we'll call Alex, saw what no one was meant to see, a ruthless act of violence that ended in a life being extinguished before their very eyes. 
At first, the perpetrators were oblivious to Alex's presence, lost in their heinous act and the rush of their escape. But a single, accidental noise, a mere shuffle of feet against the gritty pavement alerted them to the fact that they were not alone. In that heartbeat, Alex's life transformed from that of an ordinary bystander to a key witness in a horrifying crime, and more importantly to the target of a relentless hunt. Understanding the gravity of the situation, Alex fled the scene, heart pounding with the kind of adrenaline that only comes when one's life hangs by a thread. What followed was a high-stakes game of cat and mouse, with Alex constantly on the move, attempting to stay one step ahead of those who wished to silence them forever. Every shadow harbored potential danger, every stranger's glance held the possibility of recognition and death. Alex's once familiar city now felt like a labyrinthine trap, filled with unseen threats lurking around every corner. The need to remain invisible dictated every aspect of Alex's life, from the abandonment of their apartment and possessions to the adoption of disguises and the avoidance of any form of electronic communication that could lead the perpetrators to their doorstep. As the days turned into weeks, the psychological toll of constant vigilance and isolation began to wear on Alex. Paranoia became a constant companion, whispering that trust was a luxury they could no longer afford, even amongst friends and family who might inadvertently lead danger to their hideaway. But the human spirit is resilient. Despite the overwhelming fear and the seemingly insurmountable odds, Alex found moments of courage and determination. They realized that living in the shadows was no life at all, and that the only way out of this nightmare was to bring the perpetrators to justice. Gathering evidence without exposing themselves, Alex began to document everything they remembered about the crime, the perpetrators, and the events that followed. The decision to reach out to the authorities was not taken lightly. It was a calculated risk that put everything on the line, their safety, their anonymity, and their future. But with meticulous planning and the support of a dedicated detective who believed in their story, Alex stepped out of the shadows to testify, turning the table on those who sought to silence them. The trial was a spectacle, drawing attention from the media and the public alike. With every detail that emerged, the horror of that night in the alley and the subsequent chase unfolded, captivating and horrifying in equal measure. The perpetrators, confident in their power and influence, were unprepared for the strength of a silent witness who, despite everything, stood firm and spoke the truth. In the end, justice was served. The criminals were convicted, not just for the crime in the alley, but for the corruption and violence that had allowed them to believe they were untouchable. And Alex, once a silent witness, became a symbol of courage and resilience, a reminder that even in the face of unimaginable danger, one person's determination can shine a light on the darkest deeds and bring about justice. As the dust settled and the media frenzy died down, Alex began the slow process of rebuilding their life, forever changed by the events that had unfolded. Though the shadows of the past would always linger, they stepped forward into a future where they were no longer just a witness, but a survivor and a beacon of hope for others who might find themselves in the dark. In the aftermath of the trial, Alex's life gradually regained a semblance of normalcy, but the echoes of those harrowing weeks lingered like shadows at dusk. The city, with its bustling streets and towering skyscrapers, no longer felt like an indifferent backdrop to their existence, but a complex tapestry woven with threads of fear, courage, and resilience. Alex realized that survival was not just about evading the grasp of those who sought to silence them but also about confronting the haunting memories and reclaiming their sense of self. The journey to healing was fraught with challenges. Nights were often the hardest, when the silence brought back the vivid memories of the alley and the relentless pursuit that followed. But with time, those nightmares became less frequent, replaced by dreams of a future unfettered by fear. Alex found solace in writing turning their experiences into stories that encapsulated not just their own ordeal, but the universal struggle against darkness and despair. These stories, shared anonymously online, became beacons for others facing their own battles, creating a community of survivors united by their resilience. 
Public interest in Alex's story remained high, with many hailing them as a hero. Yet Alex shunned the spotlight, preferring the quiet acknowledgement of those who understood the true cost of their actions. To the world, they were a symbol of justice to themselves, merely someone who had done what was necessary. This humility became Alex's shield, protecting their identity and allowing them to navigate the complexities of a life split between ordinary existence and extraordinary circumstances. The relationship with the detective who had helped bring the perpetrators to justice evolved into a deep friendship, founded on mutual respect and the unspoken bond forged in the crucible of their shared ordeal. This friendship became a source of strength for Alex, a reminder that even in the darkest moments, there are allies who stand ready to support and defend those in need. As months turned into years, Alex embarked on a journey of advocacy, using their experience to speak out against crime and corruption. They became involved in community programs aimed at preventing violence and supporting victims, driven by the belief that change was possible through collective action and awareness. This work, though emotionally taxing, was also deeply rewarding offering a sense of purpose that transcended their own survival. In time, Alex realized that their experience had imbued them with a profound understanding of the human condition the capacity for both unspeakable evil and incredible bravery. This duality, once a source of confusion and despair, now inspired a more nuanced view of the world, one where light and darkness coexist, and the battle between them is never-ending. The alley, once a place of horror, transformed in Alex's mind into a symbol of their transformation. No longer just a silent witness to a crime, they had become a voice for those who had suffered in silence, a reminder that even the smallest light can illuminate the darkest corners of humanity. And though the journey was far from over, Alex stepped forward with a newfound resolve, ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead, buoyed by the knowledge that they were no longer alone in their fight. The story of the silent witness, though rooted in darkness, ultimately became a testament to the power of the human spirit to overcome fear, seek justice and find hope in the aftermath of tragedy. It was a reminder that even in the most desperate circumstances, each of us has the capacity to make a difference, to stand up against the shadows and say, no more and in that declaration find the strength to move forward, forever changed but undaunted, into the light of a new day.